procedure bylaw, members must enable their video to confirm quorum. If council members attending by electronic means lose connection during any portion of the hearing, we will recess the meeting until the connection is restored. If council members lose connection during the voting process, staff will get you back online quickly while we suspend the voting process. The contact information has been circulated to you. Uh, members of the public can view the proceedings via the live stream and YouTube link, which will be posted on X at Van City Clerk. Uh, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and we thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. In case of an emergency where we need to eva evacuate the building, I would like you to direct your attention to the exits. There are two exits beyond the glass doors and to the left. If these exits are obstructed, please direct your attention to the four exits here in the chamber. Please use the stairs, do not use the elevator, and I'd also like to highlight that there is a defibrillator located at the end of the hallway outside the council chamber. I also want to take a moment to recognize the immense contributions of the City of Vancouver's team members who work hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Sim is on a leave of absence for personal reasons. Councillor Carr? Uh, Councillor Kirby Young is on a leave of absence for civic business from 6 to 10 p.m. Councillor Dominato. Councillor Bly. Absent. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor uh, Acting Mayor Fry in the chair. Uh, Councillor Montague. Present. <coughs> Councillor Klassen. Councillor Meisner. Present. Councillor Joe. Present. You have quorum, Acting Mayor Fry. Thank you, Clerk. Before we begin, I have some announcements. The public may participate by speaking in person, by phone, or by submitting written comments to Mayor and Council. Speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. Speakers should also state whether they support or are opposed to the recommendations and if they are residents of the City of Vancouver. Speakers may only speak once and should follow along on X. Advanced City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meetings so they don't miss their turn to speak. Any comments on agenda items can be submitted in writing through our online web form at Mayor and Council Public Hearing Feedback web form. The link will also be posted on X. Those speaking on behalf of four or more persons or groups, including the speaker, will have eight minutes to speak and only if those represented confirm by introducing themselves on the line or in person. Those who are represented by another speaker must not be individual speakers themselves. Those represented should confirm that they're online or in the chamber. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when speaking to or addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gendered honorifics and instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. A reminder that Council's role at a public hearing is to be a quasi-judicial body, which means that council is only to consider the merits of the rezoning application or heritage designation. Council members may ask clarifying questions from speakers, including the applicant, or technical advice from staff, which should save debate for after the close of the speaker list. After speaking, hearing from speakers, council may, one, approve the application in principle, two, refuse the application, or three, refer the application to staff for further consideration. Finally, if, if council do not conclude hearing from all the speakers this evening, we will recess and reconvene this meeting on April 11th, 2024 at 6 p.m. All right. And we will start with item number one. Oh, uh, Councillor Klassen, did you have a point of privilege or... Something you want to see? I see you on the list. Actually, uh, sorry, Chair, I might have, uh, my timing might have been a little bit off. I was going to, uh, to see, ask to see if we could vary the agenda for today's meeting. Um, item six, which has quite a number of speakers associated with it, also has, um, I gather, some uh, more elderly uh, folks that uh, would like to speak as well. And uh, I know how grumpy I get um, uh, when it's too late for me, uh, being one of the older members of council. But uh, in, in, sincerely, I, I, I would, was wondering if uh, council would be willing to um, uh, either move the item to um, the, the start uh, or uh, maybe higher in the uh, today's uh, agenda 
um, uh, depending on how uh, quickly the uh, first couple of items uh, go. So, uh, all right. So, so my my I would like to move the varying the agenda to move uh, item six uh, to the beginning of the meeting if uh, if council will okay uh, so, support. So we have a motion on the floor to vary the agenda, move item six to the top of the agenda. Just a reminder that by uh, section three point four B of our procedure bylaw, that will require a two third vote to vary uh, the agenda. So, uh, motion from Councillor Classen. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Montague. Sure. Uh, all in favor? Oh, Aye. speakers. Oh, I'm sorry. Aye. I didn't see the speakers list. Uh, okay, for discussion, Councillor Dominato. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Chair, and, and thank you to Councillor Clausen for uh, the motion. I do have a quick question that just occurred to me as you were moving the motion, Councillor Clausen. It's just um, uh, all the speakers who are signed up for item six, will are, do we know if they're physically here or would be on the line and be able to notify them in time? I just... That, that's just the only thing that occurred to me because I appreciate the wanting to ensure it's not too late in the evening, but were we able to notify the uh, people who've signed up to speak? Yes, they'll be informed right away. Okay. 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 okay thank you. Councillor Carr. Oh. oh, okay. All right. So we have a motion on the floor to vary the agenda, moving item six to the first item. Uh, Moved by Councillor Class and seconded by Councillor Montague. All in favor? Uh, opposed? Uh, seeing none opposed. Okay, that does pass. And we will vary the agenda to hear item six first. And I want to make a special thank you to the thoughtful clerk who put tabs with numbers on my speaking notes here. You know who I'm talking about. All right. Item six, CD one rezoning, three two or sorry three three two nine to three four two nine West Forty First Avenue, and five six four nine to five six eight three Blenheim Street. Uh, does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on item six? Seeing none, and I'm going to remind council that we are close on quorum, so. We're good? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by Intracor Projects LTD to rezone 3329 to 3429 West 41st Avenue and 5649 to 5683 Blenheim Street from R11 Residential Inclusive District to CD1 Comprehensive Development District. This is to permit the development of a six-story, 232-unit community care facility. A floor space ratio of 2.70 and a height of 26 meters with additional height for a rooftop amenity are proposed. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendation. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing. 53 pieces of correspondence in support, 23 pieces of correspondence in opposition, and 11 pieces of correspondence dealing with other aspects of the application. And that represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this is the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND. Before the close of the speakers list, this phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added to the end of the registered speakers list. Since there are registered speakers for this item, I suggest we hear the staff presentation. We have staff from Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability here to present the application. And with that, I will pass this uh, to staff. Uh, thank you. I'm just bringing up the presentation. Okay, hey, confirming you can see my presentation. Good? Great. Good evening, Council. I'm Nick Danford, the rezoning planner for managing the file for a community care facility in the Dunbar neighborhood. Um, so the site is located on the northwest corner at the intersection of West 41st Avenue and Blenheim Street. 
The site's comprised of 10 uh, parcels stretching west from the intersection along West 41st, and is currently developed with nine single detached houses. Uh, one of the eight existing rental tenancies is eligible under the city's tenant relocation and protection policy. So, so properties to the north are, uh, of the site are generally zoned R11 and are developed with single detached houses. Across Blenheim Street to the east is the site uh, that was recently approved for a five-story rental building. Uh, properties across uh, 41st Avenue to the south are zoned R11 and generally developed with single detached houses. And then to the west is a six-story rental residential build building currently under construction, zone CD1824, um, uh, along with the uh, Dunbar Save-On that's just on the other side of uh, Collingwood, zone C2. Uh, the site is along the R4 rapid bus route with uh, the Dunbar bus loop within 400 meters of the site. Malcolm Park is nearby, um, along with the community space uh, at the uh, Carisdale Annex. So this application is being considered under the recently adopted interim rezoning policy for social housing, seniors housing, and institutional, cultural, and recreational uses, uh, IRP for short. Uh, this replaces the original enabling Dunbar community vision. Uh, the policy contain, policies contained within the new IRP are consistent with the original vision uh, that allows for consideration of rezoning for institutional uses and seniors housing. The proposal uh, is for a community care facility, which is an institutional use within the development, uh, zoning and development bylaw, defined as a use of a premises operated by a licensee under the Community Care and Assisted Living Act of BC. Uh, in this instance, the applicant has indicated that the intended population for the facility is seniors. The site is within 400 meters of uh, the Dunbar bus loop. The loop is identified as a TOA under the Provincial Bill 47. The bill contemplates buildings up to eight stories and three FSR in this location. Oh, sorry, my slide seems to have missed something. So I'll, uh, I'll go over the stats. So the proposal uh, received in uh, December 2022 uh, seeks to rezone from the underlying R11 zone to allow for a community care facility use. The proposal is for just over 200, uh, 225,000 square feet of floor area over six stories with a total height of 26 meters or 85 feet to the top of the sixth floor. The proposed FSR is 2.7, and the building would contain approximately 232 care units over two levels of underground parking uh, that would be accessed from a future lane. Um, so given the interest in the application from the community, an extended four-week virtual question and answer uh, session was held in April and May last year. Additionally, staff met with a group of neighboring residents uh, at the site to understand their concerns in greater detail. 214 pieces of correspondence were received through the application review process. So those comments received in support felt that the site location for this use was appropriate, as well as folks felt that there was a great need for uh, care of the intended population of the facility. Uh, many responses of concern were received. Uh, these responses included uh, that the form of development and massing, including the height, was too large and concern was expressed about the access to sunlight and shadowing on adjacent properties. As well, concerns about traffic, tree retention, and affordability of the care facility were also received. Uh, in response to the concerns about the building's height, the applicant did submit an addendum to their application to reduce the height of the proposal by approximately 7 feet, from 92 to 85 feet, to the top of the sixth floor. The building height is consistent with other six-story institutional buildings recently approved by Council, and staff understand that some additional height is needed to accommodate the required mechanical and air handling equipment for a care facility such as this. The 85-foot height has been reflected within the draft CD1 bylaw in Appendix A, and staff have provided conditions in Appendix B to further explore reduction of overall height and massing. Now, with regards to traffic, Engineering staff have reviewed the submitted transportation study and proposed development. Results uh, of that study identified that the proposed development would not generate a significant amount of new traffic from this type of facility. Conditions in Appendix B seek to deliver improvements to address safety for all road users 
and this includes street and intersection of improvements, along with the 17-foot dedication from 41st Avenue. So given the institutional use proposed, the application is subject to a fixed rate institutional CAC. The value combined with the expected DCLs and public art contribution for the project, the total public benefits valued for this application is just over $7.4 million. So staff support the proposed community care facility use, including 232 uh, care units at this location under the interim rezoning policy, subject to conditions outlined in Appendix B, and staff and the applicant are available for questions. Thank you, Council. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, we also have the applicant team here to present and speak to the application. Uh, applicant team? Sure, we'll get somebody to help you load the presentation. I think we got it. Sorry, uh, before we begin, Councillor Montague, I see you on the queue. Are you just waiting for uh, yes, sir. a moment? Okay, good. Okay, please uh, proceed. Good evening, Acting Mayor and members of Council. Thank you for having me. My name is Allison Keller, and I'm the Site Development Ambassador for Amicus Senior Lifestyles. I am joined by Farouk Babul, Vice President of Development for Intercor. Amica, with our development partner, Intercor, is proposing a private pay seniors community care residence with long-term care, memory care, and assisted living for Dunbar. What we know from our 28 years of experience is that approximately 80% of residents move in from the surrounding neighborhood, or they move into Amica to be close to family who are living nearby. At our continuum of care residences, we can help elderly couples remain together, even if they have different physical or cognitive needs. We create an environment with an array of amenities that foster social connectedness, and we provide personalized services that promote well-being. At Amica, residents can age in place with dignity and grace. Dunbar has one of the most rapidly aging populations in Vancouver. However, no new community care facilities have been built in the last 25 years. Through close to two years of public engagement, we learned seniors are struggling to find appropriate housing in Dunbar. I ask you to keep this in mind while we consider that the population of seniors aged 75 plus is going to, is projected to nearly double in the next 15 to 20 years. And by 2068, older, older seniors in BC are projected to quadruple. So if the demands for housing with care are not being met today, where are Dunbar seniors going to find it tomorrow? Is it going to be in the hallways of the hospitals? Or are they going to have to move elsewhere outside of their own community? Our proposal would not only help reduce the pressures on our shared healthcare system, but it will provide a valuable resource for the neighborhood where its residents can age safely in place. The building has been designed to respond to the current and future context. 
The proposal complies with the city's current interim rezoning policy for seniors housing in former community um, vision areas, and it meets the intent of the Vancouver plan. Furthermore, it speaks to the future provincial legislation for transit-oriented areas. To complement the city's public consultation, we spent close to two years engaging the community with open and respectful dialogue. We held regular stakeholder meetings, including with representatives from the Dunbar Residents Association. We've connected with our immediate neighbors through an area letter canvas, follow-up letters, emails, calls, and four in-person meetings including a site tour that was supported by our project team. We organized two in-person displays of our proposal to complement the city's online open house. We held a seniors focused symposium that included a lunch and learn, an evening panel of experts, and an expo of local organizations and businesses. Over 120 community members attended a community advisory group, and a steering committee were formed to help us develop a programming framework for a community amenity space within the project. And over 70 seniors were engaged at two events we organized at the Dunbar Community Centre. Plus, we participated in an event there where there were over 5,000 attendees and where we fielded queries about our project. From our engagement efforts, we learned of three prime concerns from the immediate neighbors and the broader community. One, the scale of the development for immediate neighbors, including concerns about the impact of the new laneway. Two, the lack of community resources for seniors in Dunbar. And three, the urgent need for more seniors housing with care. Good evening, Acting Mayor and Council. Uh, Dunbar has been Dunbar has been relatively unchanged for a long time, but over the next five, ten, fifteen years, it is expected to transition to meet our city's growing housing needs. Low and mid rises along Forty First, low rises off arterials and mid-rises and even high-rises along the intersection of West 41st and Dunbar. The building design is sensitive to its surrounding uses and proactively addresses a number of urban design considerations. On the front, we've carved back the building into three distinct masses. We've stepped the building back on the fifth and the sixth levels to reduce the scale and lend more of a residential character. We added generous setbacks to improve the public realm with large sidewalks and tree plantings, plus a dedication for future roadworks and transit. At the rear, we set back the building from the property line to allow for the lane dedication to the city. This lane currently exists, and the proposal extends the lane through to Blenheim, providing access to the main entry of the building, as well as access to the six-story rental building that's currently under construction, and it would support the future redevelopment of the neighbors along West 40th. Similarly, the upper floors were also stepped back on the fifth and sixth levels to minimize overlook and shadow. And we further carved the building back to provide relief and open space. In response to concerns from the immediate neighbor, we conducted peer reviews of the major building systems and optimized the design tolerance specific to this proposal to reduce the, the overall building height. This resulted in a seven foot reduction in building height, which is the absolute minimum required to deliver a quality care environment. We've listened. We also listened to concerns regarding traffic, loading, and garbage, and we'll be addressing those through an operations management plan. We've listened, we've learned, and we've responded, and we'll continue to be good neighbors. We responded to the call for more resources by organizing an educational symposium for seniors and their families last June. And in that same month, 
when the Ivy condominiums were flooded above Stongs, we offered our resources to help its residents, many of whom were seniors, and also to building management alike to help them get through the crisis swiftly. We also collaborated on a framework to, for a community amenity space so that neighbors could connect at our project. Moreover, we collaborated with the Dunbar Community Centre to create a new senior social club, and we will be providing them senior-friendly furniture. This proposal directly responds to the needs of the community. Acting Mayor and Council, this is why we've assembled tonight. With your support, we could house and care for 1,000 seniors over 10 years. Plus, we could return hundreds of homes to the market, boost the local economy, ease the pressures on the shared healthcare system, and crucially, help Dunbar residents age within the community they call home. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alison uh, Farouk. Okay. Um, now I'm going to invite questions from council to staff or the applicant team, noting that this is the only opportunity for council to ask questions of the applicant. Uh, starting with Councillor Montague. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks, Chair. Um, oh, thanks for the presentation. You actually answered uh, almost all of my questions with your presentation, um, uh, especially with regards to the lane and the the current construction of the building that's to the west of you. Um, uh, I noticed that um, the properties uh, that you're assembling, they're actually fairly, uh, they're fairly long, 170 foot properties. Is that gonna enable you to provide a, a full uh, regular, a regular size laneway in between, uh, behind you and the houses behind? Uh, 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 correct. Door. So a 20 foot lane is being dedicated from the rear of the north property line, uh, and that would enable the existing lane to, to push through uh, from Collingwood to Blenheim. Okay. And I guess my only other question that you didn't answer in your presentation was 232 units. Um, what's, this, what's the ratio going to be of um, uh, medium care to uh, high level care? Or do you know that yet? Thank you for the question, Councillor. We will be licensed for 100% care, and 60%, or actually just slightly over 60%, will be long-term care, including memory care. Okay. I think that's all my questions, Chair. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Carr. Thank you. Um, I noticed uh, uh, that uh, in the report, Schedule B, which outlines a number of issues um, like tree retention, etc., notes that um, there are 50 trees on site and uh, I think 11 city trees and all the on-site trees will be cut and six city trees will be cut. Um, so given that there's quite a concern around tree canopy um, from a, I think, uh, neighborhood um, level, a climate perspective. Um, the shading is invaluable in terms of cooling homes in um, intense summer heat. Um, how do you intend, I guess, to handle um, that? And how many trees are you planting? It says you're going to plant some, but I'm not sure what your plans are in that regard. Uh, so uh, at minimum, uh, there'd be a one-to-one -one tree replacement. Oh. Uh, and approximately 60 trees are being planted on site. Okay, that's great. Um, are you going to be including heating and cooling in the building? We've, we know during the heat dome that many, many seniors were the ones who died in Vancouver for lack of cooling in the buildings. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Absolutely we are. You know, the average age of our residents is 90, and at 90 you have more difficulties regulating your own body temperatures. So having an environment that is conducive to good health through the temperature control is absolute paramount in our design. I'm, I'm assuming that all new buildings in Vancouver are looking to be net zero, so heat pumps or those kinds of things that are what you're looking at. Is that correct? Great. Correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Those are my questions, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Dominetto. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I also had a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned at the outset um, the need for seniors' care and aging in place, and you referenced assisted living, memory care, and long-term care. 
Um, does this model presume that um, uh, you can move through the different levels of care? So as needs change, um, it could be accommodated um, in this space as opposed to having to relocate to another location, another home. Is that, could you expand a little bit on the model? Yes, Councillor, happy to. So in a continuum of care model, that's exactly the idea that as a resident, as a resident's needs change, they're not going to have to move again. And we, in fact, would be licensed to even provide palliative support right through to end of life. And as I mentioned earlier, too, that, you know, we can help elderly couples remain together and they might have very different needs going on. We can help them stay together right through to end of life. Great. Thank, thanks for sharing that. And then um, noting uh, you referenced some of the demographic data and trends and, and what's projected. When you looked at, um, I think one of you referenced that, that, you know, the community hasn't changed significantly, but people are wanting to stay. We hear this often is wanting to stay within their community, um, downsize. Um, what, um, what, but what does the landscape look like today if you are wanting to um, move into um, different housing um, uh, in the neighborhood? Is there a lot available? We often talk about lack of available space for any type of housing in the city. I'm just curious what it looks like, the picture, a snapshot today. Um, well, it's not a good snapshot. I wish I could paint a happier picture for you, but that's why we're here tonight. You know, you have 1,205 private pay suites on the west side, and that includes 54 for memory care. You also have 1,990 long-term care suites. Now, long-term care, you're looking at about 209 days on the wait list. And at Amica's continuum of care models, the demand is so high that our occupancy is full, and we are experiencing wait lists of six to eight months to upwards to two years. Because that is a desirable model, because when people move in, they don't have to move. Yeah. Thank you. That's all my questions, Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Dominato. Seeing no further questions, uh, we're going to move to speakers. Uh, at this point, I'm going to issue the second call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106 pound Before the end of the speakers list, phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium before the close of the speaker list. Speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merit of the report being considered. We will now hear from the public, starting with speaker number one, Betty Thompson. It's Betty Thompson here. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this matter. My name is Betty Thompson, and I represent the Dunbar Seniors Cafe, which is a group of seniors who meet regularly to talk about senior issues. I enthusiastically support the Amica building on West 41st Avenue in Blenheim in Vancouver's West west side and let me explain why. First of all, the proportion of seniors in the west side is 21% compared to only 15% in all of Vancouver. That speaks to the need of an additional senior residence that is needed in this area. This location is excellent because it will allow family members who live in the area to visit and support their loved ones. As one of many seniors who moved to this area to be close to my family, uh, the need for a new residence in my future is essential so my family can visit. At the same time, I do not wish to be a burden to my family. And so, <clears throat> as I become less and less independent, the continuum of care facility will guarantee me a home without disrupting my family and having me move to a different facility after I either become demented or require long-term care. A continuum of care facility is needed because dementia and long-term care needs are increasing exponentially. This facility will allow residents to move from one section of care to another, 
allowing seniors to stay in one facility for the duration of their lives. And finally, the proposed facility will be a strong asset to the neighborhood in the community in that it will have a specified area for neighbors and community members to come and mingle and engage in activities with residents. For me and my family, this proposed facility is a godsend to this area, and I strongly and enthusiastically support it. Please approve this proposal. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Any okay. questions? Uh, I don't see any questions. I think you were pretty succinct and made your point quite clearly. Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaker number two, Alma Lee. <laughs> Me again. <laughs> Whoever does this, thank you. Um, good evening, Acting Mayor Fry and Council Members. My name is Alma Lee. I'm a Vancouver resident and I've served this community as the founder of the Vancouver Writers Festival and more recently as a board member of the South Granville Senior Centre. I'm an elder living alone and understand the importance of living with purpose at any age and aging well in place. Recently, I supported Amica's proposed continuum of care residents at Nanton and Arbutus, and I thank you for approving this urgently needed project. Tonight, I'm here again, this time in support of Amica's proposal for a new continuum of care residents for Dunbar. I encourage you to improve the rezoning to help expedite this construction. I say this because many elders are worried about finding housing options that will support us in, as needs change. The housing choice for aging well on the west side are scarce, and more of us are becoming increasingly anxious as we consider what the future looks like. For example, what choices will provide available access to long-term care when we need it most? What choices will foster vibrant and fulfilling living? What will be able to, what will we be able to, will we be able to stay close to our families? Will we have to move more than once? These are tough questions that contribute to the anxiety. The answer is to support moving things along as soon as possible on building more continuum care options, such as the proposal to build for Dunbar right away. I recently had the pleasure of touring Amica Arbutus Manor. I was impressed by the thriving social community there. I was also impressed by the attentiveness of the staff. I also had lunch, and the food was totally on par with any quality restaurant. That is a true picture of aging well. Mayor Kim and members of, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mix this up all the time. Members of council, I believe the seniors in the Dunbar community should be given the same opportunity. That is to say, live with purpose, age comfortably and happily, and be able to stay in their neighborhood to do so. Therefore, I ask you to vote in favor of Amica's proposal and get this and help get this project built. Many seniors and families will be most grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Alma. All right, uh, seeing no questions. Moving on, speaker number three, Henry Liu. Henry Liu here. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint uh, presentation sorry, uh, that I sorry. prepared. I'm sorry, Henry, one I, sec. Oh, okay. Henry, so apparently you're on the list. I, didn't, I was wondering what Rep PPT meant. Apparently you're a representative speaker. Um, do you have your rep, the people you're representing with you? Um, I think, uh, well, I'm part of a neighborhood group of 250 neighbors, but I'm really here speaking, I guess, I guess on my own behalf. Okay, it's the difference between five minutes and eight minutes. So I requested for eight, but if I can only get five, I'm, I'd be grateful for that as well. Thank you. You can get five. Okay, great. So, um, Council, thank you for your time. My name is Henry. I'm a resident of Vancouver. I live actually very close to the, to the Amica proposed building. 
I'm here um, opposing not the entire proposal, but only the height. The height is the only issue. And I want to just bring to the council's attention that the, why the height is so destructive for the neighboring properties and why there's a better solution. There's a very simple win-win solution that the council can consider. Um, so the next slide, please. So just to be clear, we are in support on behalf of all the 250 neighbors that have um, banded together on this. Uh, we are in support of the extra density, seniors housing, all the previous speakers. We agree why extra additional senior housing is needed. This height being proposed by Amica of 85 to 100 feet tall is for super luxury. That's the only reason why this height exists. Our normal seniors building of six stories is 69 to 70 feet tall, 73 feet tall, maybe max. I worked in the industry for 13 years, and so I would just want to make, make, help the council make an informed decision about the height of this proposal. So next slide, please. I've drawn the proposed Amica building height relative to other six-story buildings, okay? And this is drawn to scale. And the Amica building is 85 to 100 feet tall, including the amenity seventh floor. It's actually a seventh floor height. The normal seniors housing, uh, a normal senior care building for complex and memory care, six story is 60, uh, basically 66 to 70 feet tall. Market rental building, six story tall, is six stories tall is, has a maximum height of 65 feet. The streamline rental policy, the, the building, the six story market rental building next to the Amica proposed building is also only 69 feet tall. So there's a 30, 20 to 30% height increase on the proposed Amica building. So next slide. So this is the impact. The neighboring properties to the north face the south. This is different from the Nanton and the Granville proposal where the properties face east-west. They get a lot more sunlight. This site is very unique in the sense that the properties to the north, the lots are short. They're only 100 feet deep and they face south. So what happens when you have a 500 feet wide building, 530 feet wide building, that's extra with the extra height, it puts the entire um, houses to the north in shadow for virtually the entire year. This destroys their livability. The sunlight is gone. This is a huge impact, and all the neighbors along there are seriously opposed to this. And I want to bring the councils, bring this to the council's attention. So next slide, please. So Amica has cleverly camouflaged the height as being needed for mechanical and air handling equipment. This is simply false. It's not true. I personally spoken to the mechanical engineer at Building Energy Solutions and the architect at Wheeler and Crawford & Sons. Both firms are highly respected firms that specialize in the design of complex care, senior care homes in Vancouver. There is an extra uh, three feet per floor proposed in the Amica building. There's no need for that extra height to handle the necessary HVAC equipment. The only reason is opulence and luxury and high rents. That's the reason for the extra height. You need the extra height to convey opulence and luxury. Okay, so next slide. I want to demonstrate this with other buildings. This is the, this is the Creekstone Care Center that was built in, during COVID, six stories tall, complex and memory care, based in North Vancouver, 70 feet tall. Okay, beautiful building. 70 feet tall versus 85 to 100 feet. So next, this is Amica's own building. Amica's own building in Victoria that, just, that was designed and built during COVID, opened in December of 2023, six stories tall, six stories high, 72 feet tall. Again, much, much lower, 13 feet lower than what's proposed in Dunbar. And it's a luxury building. Next slide, please. Same building featured in the Victoria News in December 2023. It's a luxury building, $15,000 a month, right? Next slide. This is the building right next to the Amica site, currently under construction. Six stories. And look at what they did. They dropped the height to 69 feet, and the shadow impact on neighboring property is significantly less. It's gone. Okay, I want to demonstrate this because it's possible. They are able to do it. I don't know why Amica is not able to. It's not, it's not held to the same standard. Next slide. I looked at the policy framework for council. But what is the Vancouver plan, the interim rezoning policy, secure rental policy, even Bill 47? Nothing allows excessive and unreasonable height 
to be built. Six stories, yes. Unreasonable height, no. Okay, so next slide. So the problem is the extra height sorry, and Henry, the. I've just realized um, I space. I was watching your slideshow. You're over five. I'm. A, I'm sorry. So just okay. Wrap it up. Yeah. No, I think uh, so. If I could wrap, just there's a simple solution. We can keep the. We can reduce the height. Still keep the same number of units, the same density, same use. Six stories. Seniors are well served. So it's by reducing the height, Amica still gets a luxury senior care building. I think that's a win okay. solution for all. So. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or? Nope, there's no questions. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, all right, uh, speaker number four is Dr. Gregory Tobert. Dr. Gregory Tobert on the phone. Yes, uh, good evening. I wish to speak, um, I wish to thank the acting mayor and council for giving me the opportunity to speak to this important matter. I wish to speak in favor of the application for a new seniors continuum of care facility at 3329 West 41st Avenue. My name is Greg Tobert. I am a senior and a lifelong resident of Vancouver. I have lived in the community of Dunbar for the past 27 years. I am a semi-retired family physician and I have had the privilege of caring for patients in the Lower Mainland for over 40 years. During my career as a family physician, I have on numerous occasions witnessed aging and frail seniors trying desperately to remain safely in their own homes. However, due to the limited resources available in our health care system, often the difficult decision to transition to a residential care facility becomes necessary in order to remain safe and obtain the necessary personal care. Due to a scarcity of residential care facilities in our city, seniors often face a significant waiting period before a place in an appropriate facility becomes available. Tragically, during this waiting period, events may occur which necessitate a visit to an emergency department to seek care at an acute care facility. Often, this results in an admission to the hospital and so this frail elderly patient occupies an acute care bed for a prolonged period of time while waiting for placement in a residential care facility. This results in a less than ideal situation for the frail senior, as well as an extremely poor utilization of an acute care bed. Additionally, once a patient is placed in a residential care facility, that facility may not be designed to provide an appropriate level of care if the needs of the resident change and they may, must be transferred once again to another facility. There is strong medical evidence that such transfers have a profound negative impact upon the health of a frail senior. The proposed facility at 41st and Blenheim offers a continuum of care which would allow the ongoing care of a patient in a single facility, even with changes in their required level of care. The recent pandemic has brought into sharp focus the dire need for modern residential care facilities that are designed to keep seniors safe in the face of such health care emergencies. Faced with the demographics of a rapidly aging boomer generation, the need for such facilities is both great and urgent. Therefore, in order to address the scarcity of safe, modern residential care facilities in our community and to provide an optimum health care strategy within a single facility, I respectfully ask that you would give your kind consideration to approving and expediting this application. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Tobera. Uh, we are uh, now moving on to speaker number five, uh, Stephanie Chan. Stephanie Chan? Hi, Stephanie. Hello, Acting Mayor and Council. My name is Stephanie Chan. I have been a senior living advisor for 17 years. Through my business, Home to Home, I help families 
and seniors navigate through decisions when they're looking for seniors housing and other care services. I am in support of this development and I thought I would just share quickly some commentary around some real life challenges that I see families going through to lend some perspective on why I support the development. In working with families, I've long felt that the supply of seniors housing is not meeting the pace of demand of our growing population of seniors. And this um, is evidenced or associated with three things that I wanna discuss, some of which have already been discussed already. The first is the increasing wait lists. Compared to say five years ago, pre-pandemic, wait lists for seniors residences have gone up, I would say about 50 to 100%. And they've gone up across the board for all types of residences, but they're particularly high for residences that provide a high level of care in-house. So what this means is that seniors who have decided that they and or their spouse, that it's time for them to move into a senior's residence, they're being asked to wait a very long time. And they're forced to come up with an interim solution while they're waiting for a spot to open up. Now that interim solution sometimes comes in the form of home care, which has its own drawbacks and gaps in the whole home care ecosystem. And more often than not, family members have to step in and provide that care to fill those gaps, which leads to the second area of stress that I see, which is family caregiver burnout. And that can take place through um, family caregivers who are spouses and family caregivers who are the adult children in the sandwich generation. Um, so th while the, they're waiting for the spot to open up, the family caregivers are getting burnt out. The third thing that I wanna mention is the difficulties of families and, and the spouses that are seniors um, in finding ways that they can find housing and stay together. Often is the case as spouses age, rarely do they have the same health trajectory, right? And so more often than not, um, their care needs diverge and one spouse becomes the primary family caregiver of the other spouse. And so when it's time to move, they're looking for this housing solution that we've talked about tonight called a continuum of care. The current um, state in Vancouver is that there actually aren't very many continuums of care, and we absolutely need more of them. Um, there aren't very many in greater Vancouver, let alone the city of Vancouver. And so it's a great solution to keep um, couples together as they age. Um, so I really feel like we need to support the development of more seniors housing in our communities. A great number of seniors will reach a point, a chapter in their lives when moving into a senior's residence is the best option for them to ha live safely and happily. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, speaker number six. Uh, North Vancouver. Okay. Yes, but, um, well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Laura Ferguson. I am the general manager at Amica Lionsgate, where I've had the privilege of serving seniors and their families for over four years. I understand from firsthand experience the many benefits a private pay residence can provide, especially a state-of-the-art residence that provides a full continuum of care like the one that is proposed by Amica and Intracorp for Dunbar. I come before you today, not only as an advocate for congregate senior living, but also from the perspective of a granddaughter. Several years ago, I moved to Vancouver to become more involved in the lives of my grandparents who lived in Dunbar for many years. I've seen how strong, relationship, how strong the relationship is to their community and how these important social connections continue to be a priority as they aged. Appointments with a trusted hairdresser, impromptu visits to their local coffee shop, and walks along streets filled with familiar faces illustrate simple yet vital daily activity, li living activities. It's just my grandmother now. I'm committed to guiding her through her decision making as her needs change while keeping her in the same neighborhood where her heart and memories are deeply rooted and where her key community relationships remain accessible. In my professional life, I see the same scenario play out every day 
as I, along with our highly skilled team, help seniors and their families navigate complex decisions every day. They're all seeking peace of mind in their decision making. Peace of mind, will they be able to age in place within their own community? And peace of mind, they won't have to move again. We know social connections are vital to healthy aging and building age-friendly communities. I see this manifested in the resident experience every day in newly formed friendships and connections made. Through celebrating milestone life events, discovering new hobbies like gardening or line dancing, and enjoying meals together in the dining rooms filled with conversation and laughter. Access to these opportunities cannot be overlooked when thinking of the many benefits senior livings provide. Social connectedness and sense of purpose not only help sustain healthy aging, but they also preserve capacity in our healthcare system, especially when disruptive moves are avoided. 18 months ago, we opened our doors to our new expansion at Amica Lionsgate, offering assisted living. This now completes the full continuum of care model as our original residence offers fully licensed long-term care, including memory care. I've personally facilitated the transition of several assisted living residents to licensed long-term care within our residence. The peace of mind our residents experience knowing they can remain home and stay connected to their community of friends and neighbors, even as their health situations change, is invaluable. It's also important to note, given the average age at Amica is 90, many times the adult children are seniors themselves. Relieving this burden and recognizing the multi-generational benefits cannot be overlooked. A full continuum of care model is also ideal for supporting couples as they age together with different health needs. In our residence, each unique need is supported by a professional healthcare team, which preserves marital relationships by avoiding unwanted shift from loving spouse to dutiful caregiver. Even with this expansion, our current wait list sits at 153. Our closest sister residence with a full continuum of care model, Amica Edgemont Village, has 154 on its waiting list. Wait times range from six to eight months and can be upwards of two years. I wonder and worry, how long can Vancouver seniors like my grandmother wait? Mr. Mayor and members of council, I ask you as a seniors advocate and granddaughter to please approve this crucially needed development proposal to help improve and protect protect the lives of seniors and their families in Dunbar. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> okay. Uh, speaker number seven is Ellie, or sorry, my, my, my apologies, Effie Taylor. Hi, Effie. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'll try really hard. <laughs> not to become emotional, but this is a very personal issue for me. I was introduced to Allison at Amica about three years ago, shortly after my mother was diagnosed with dementia and then Alzheimer's. My mother was unable to stay in her home any longer, and we were looking for somewhere that would be able to address her changing needs. It's a horrible disease and it progresses. Our number one priority was keeping her in her community, close to family and friends. My situation is a little bit unique. I live in Dunbar. I support this proposal. My mother lived in Toronto, and she still does. Allison told me about a new Amica facility that was being built close to where she lived, which was close to our family home. And my mother moved in there this past February. My brother lives five minutes away and goes to visit her several times a day. That would not be possible if it was not built within her community. As you can imagine, the highlight of my mother's day is visits from her family and friends, and that's made possible by the proximity of this facility being in her community. I live in Dunbar. I've been a resident since 2009. I have two children. 
who both attend school in Dunbar, Dunbar, in the Dunbar Carisdale area. My mother raised my kids when they were younger so that my husband and I could work. My mother is 83 years old and aside from Alzheimer's does not have any other health issues. We expect her to be with us for a long time. My hope is to bring her to Vancouver someday and nothing would make my family happier than knowing that she could be close to us in our community where we could see her every day. My daughters are established in Vancouver. One of my daughters goes to Crofton House School, which is kitty corner to the proposed development. And I, my other daughter hopes to jo join her there soon. Nothing would make them happier than being able to stop by and see their grandmother after school. I support the proposal. I support it because of my personal situation and I support it because I know other families in the community will be faced with the same difficult decisions that we were faced with. Amica has been the best partner in my mother's care. They allow her to experience this awful disease with dignity and respect. They treat her like family and I have no doubt that Amica would treat our community the same. I'm not an engineer, I don't know anything about building height, but I would like to say that in the Amica facility that she's in now, she's currently in memory care, which is on the seventh floor. And the seventh floor has beautiful high ceilings, which create a very open and inviting atmosphere. To me, it's about healthy seniors living. My mother does not get out as much as she used to. She goes on all of the planned activities and excursions. But what I can say is while she's there on the seventh floor, the beautiful gardens and space they created have allowed my mother to age in a way that has respected her dignity. So I would just like to say that I'm in support of this proposal. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Effie, and thanks for sharing your story. Okay, uh, speaker number eight has withdrawn, so we will jump right over to speaker number nine, uh, Pamela Bowles. Hey, Pamela. Hi, how are you? Acting Mayor and Council, uh, I've been a Vancouver Westside resident for four decades. For three of those decades, I've been residing within two or three blocks of the proposed development. Generally speaking, I haven't had very favorable views of some of the development that's been approved for the west side of Vancouver. That includes some apartment buildings right around the corner from this development on Dunbar, which back onto Collingwood Place, a street on which I used to live. However, I am very much in favor of the present and proposed development. <clears throat> Pardon me. I have brought with me some copies for sharing with you of the World Social Report of the United Nations called no one, Leaving No One Behind in an Aging World. Uh, it is a very recent report on global demographics on aging and a concept that maybe other speakers may not attend to and uh, we all share our life experiences to some degree and are informed by them. Um, my 88-year-old mother resides with me. I moved to Vancouver in 1984 to attend law school, and I never left. And my mother followed. My uh, father did as well. He passed, and now she moves uh, to live with me and my husband. My husband is a senior. He's 76 years of age. I am not yet a senior. However, uh, what I have learned uh, over the course of a number of years is that the needs of groups uh, with which uh, or of which you are not a member tend to be at times outside your periphery when they shouldn't be. My focus was drawn to seniors' uh, issues not only by my mother and her friends, but also by my own experience. My husband and I used to uh, take our uh, Rottweilers to do therapy work in various seniors' facilities to attend seniors, and I was struck then by how seniors in our society tended to be warehoused. It generally was the case that until the dogs came along, the seniors would be parked at tables and no one would be speaking, and they lit up with much to say when the dogs came along to be patted and to cuddle. This development are close to uh, my residence is very important in terms of the issue of dependency. 
as more of our population ages and becomes senior, our population shrinks in terms of those upon whom the seniors can be dependent. That's the nature of our demographic and birth rates in Canada and much of the world. I should say that um, with respect to the comment from uh, one of the other speakers about what's normal for seniors housing, I'd encourage you to consider the fact that normal is what we make it. Normal is not necessarily what has been accepted in the past or developed in the past. Um, I should say in terms of uh, one of the councillors asked about alternatives. I've invested, investigated alternatives because of my mother. She's uh, yet able to reside. She can walk upstairs. She has a number of health issues. However, I couldn't even get a call back from Blenheim Lodge when I called, and I certainly didn't get one when I emailed. The link on their website, and it's, I appreciate, a Christian-based um, uh, seniors facility, which has been on the west side since 1969. Those buildings have been around since the 60s. Um, the link to the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority on their website doesn't even work. Uh, other facilities in the area, such as Crofton Manor, we've heard uh, one of the speakers talk about twelve to $15,000. Uh, I'm aware of uh, charges of up to 20000 But the fact of matters is, is there is a shortage or an absence of alternatives. It would be wonderful if we had full paid social, uh, socially supported seniors housing in BC and in Vancouver. The fact is we don't. Uh, the fact is we don't have enough uh, seniors housing at all. And one of the most important things in my uh, submission to you to consider is that Seniors have issues of personal security that are not met by them being at the end of a hall, behind a door, in a condo. They have physical issues of falls that their frailty can cause, common uh, consideration for physicians, that are not addressed by being in a condo at the end of the hall. Um, I don't seek to wait two or three years to uh, have an admission for a loved one who is desperate for care. And I would encourage you to approve the proposal so that other families also don't have to wait and have the agony of that in their lives. Thank you so much. And I uh, have the uh, article for distribution to you. Thanks, Pamela. Appreciate that. Clerk will circulate it. Uh, next speaker, speaker number 10 is Joyce Wagonar. Joyce, I hope I got your last name right. I did. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Acting Mayor and Councillors. My name is Joyce Wagner. I'm a Vancouver resident. In fact, my property borders onto the north side of the proposed Amica project site. And certainly I support densification and I support seniors housing, but I oppose this project in its current form. And that is because of the height and the massing of the building, which makes it a luxury product, which truly impacts the livability of uh, current and future residents on the neighboring properties. I do believe a building can be developed um, to meet Amica's needs uh, and to meet the city's needs with the same new number of units of housing while maintaining the livability for all. In terms of my impact of the proposed design, the height and massing would block out sunlight on my property for most of the year. Um, several trees in my property would have to be cut down and I would no longer be able to enjoy my garden. I would no longer be able to enjoy my backyard, which is quite an impact. Um, it's important to note that next to the proposed Amica site at Collingwood and 41st, as referenced earlier, there's a six-story building under construction, and it was approved under the streamlined rental policy. And this developer incorporates a lower height and terracing so that the shades in the neighbor's yards is dramatically less. And we feel this is an example of sustainable building. Not only does it create affordable homes, it transitions well to the neighbor neighboring residential homes. And this is important because it applies equally well to the single family homes on the properties today, or perhaps future four story multifamily structures uh, that those properties are designed for in future. So a poor design decision today uh, will impact more and more Vancouver residents 10, 20, 30 years from now. 
We feel that if uh, Amica can let go of these luxury height ceilings, um, and instead of running the eight HVAC through the ceilings, but through the corridors like many other um, senior care facilities, uh, the height can be reduced without removing units from the market. I'd also like to speak to the public engagement. I heard earlier uh, an AMICA representative speak how they've been busy for several years in terms of this project. Uh, the local residents really have been engaged over the last year. And initially, this was presented to us as a six-story building. And although it technically does have six stories, those stories are much higher than your average typical 70-foot, six-story buildings. Buildings are assigned stories because then they can conjure up sort of a mental image in the idea of people of, oh, a six-story building, yes, that's consistent with the rental policy, that's consistent with 41st, that should be approved. But much to our surprise, we learned how much higher that building would be. And that actually, I heard it earlier, it's unfortunate you have to be an engineer to figure out what these building heights are. But luckily, we have some engineers on our streets who said, gee, at 92, 94 feet, that's equivalent to a nine-story building. And that has significant shade impacts, as does the massing of the building, which goes on for more than a city block without any breaks. Over 100 residents shared concerns during the April 23rd public engagement period, and the building was reduced by seven feet. And this did absolutely nothing to reduce any of the impacts in a meaningful way. Although it was an appreciated gesture, I think more can be done. In uh, recent weeks, over 250 local residents have now signed an online petition. And like myself, everyone is in support of seniors housing and seniors housing on that site. But the structure of that building needs to change. And we feel if that happens, it's a good outcome for Dunbar residents there's more seniors housing. It's good for the city. There's more housing stock and taxes. It's good for the neighbors like myself. There's less shadow and privacy impact. And it's good for Amica because they can proceed with a development without losing complete support of all of the immediate neighbors to the north. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, next is speaker number 11, uh, Catherine Lawrence. Um, oh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Acting Mayor and Council. Council. My name is Catherine Lawrence, and um, I'm a homeowner directly behind the proposed develop development on West 40th, a neighbor of Joyce. And um, I'm here today just to say that we, um, we do support senior living. I myself had two senior parents, had dementia, and it was a journey that was very difficult, and I do understand that, and we, as we all do with all the stories about um, parents in those kind of situations or loved ones. Um, I know um, my parents would have liked to have aged at home, but unfortunately they both had dementia, and it just didn't work out that way. So, um, hence, um, it ended up that while my dad was gone, I moved into my parents' house, and then I just decided to stay because I thought my parents would be happy for that, that my daughter and I live in, their, in our, the house that I grew up in. That's a personal note. So, um, I hope today we could provide you with some key insights of this Amica development in that it needs a little bit further exploration as far as this building that's right behind us, and I can't say how devastating it was for us to sort of finally realize how big this building was, despite you know the um, the obvious need for um, for the um, senior care. So, um, first thing, I'm just saying that we do not oppose the senior housing, um, and it's the shadow impact on the north side of the um, building. Um, and through lengthy study on our part and meetings and volunteer cons consulting professionals, it is obvious to us this height is excessive, and uh, we believe that it's. Um, for the purpose of luxury. We believe this luxury um, could be possible by lowering the height um, of the building and or making any way that, that could make less impact on the neighbors, oops, sorry, to the, um, to the north. Um, I think, you know, eventually there'll be many people that will be living on our street, not just us. So we don't want to make it all about us, um, but, you know, there could be, um, townhouses or down the road or other things, and people need to have 
um, you know, sunlight or some um, trees and greenery and that kind of thing. Um, anyways, attention would have to be um, beneficial for, yeah, for future people living on the street. Sorry. Um, the building is positioned east-west, and that just has, as we've said, more impact with the shadow. Um, there should be more care to, to ensure the shadow impact. Um, if we live in Vancouver, we depend on sunshine for mental health, drying out moisture, flowers, tree growth, etc. And I feel like, you know, my backyard is just going to be sort of gone, and I certainly don't really feel like there's hope for um, having that nice um, sunshine coming in. Um, Anyways, the emotional toll on all of us has been great um, as well. We're not, uh, like I said, we're not opposed to senior housing, but I think we have a duty to carefully consider this type of height in a residential community um, as, as ours. And as Joyce pointed out about the uh, details of the height. Anyways, thank you for your uh, attention, and we are only hoping a compromise and consult. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, next is speaker number 12, Rabab Ward. Good evening. My name is Dr. Rabab Ward, and I happen to be Professor of Emeritus of Engineering at UBC, but that's another one. I am one of those people who will be deeply hurt and affected badly by this massive building. However, listening to everybody and thinking about it, I will, st I will not oppose it. Instead, the building height should be really reduced to between 66 to 69 feet, which is the normal height for a six-story in anywhere in BC. Um, the, this building is immediately south of our garden. It spreads almost for a double blocks all the way from the east to the west like 500 feet or more, that building and then continuing. So we will get no sunlight, nothing, not one hour for at least six months of the year. And then even now on April 9, if, if, you, if you look at it, in the morning we will not get sunlight and after three, three, three after mid-afternoon and we, there will be no sunlight. It's too tall. 100 feet, 85 to 100 feet will cast a shadow of 318 feet. It will cover us and cover also our neighbors. So all the 30 properties on our street, just north of this building, will be in shadow. This is besides, we will be adjacent to a really busy back alley that they will build at the edge of our garden, just 35 feet from, our, from where we sleep. So yes, we will be d badly hurt. It's really too tall because they want it to be super luxury. They can build luxury inside every room without having it with high, these high roofs. There's so many ways for, to build luxury inside. Besides, what we really need here is affordable, senior homes. This is not affordable. We need good quality, but not super luxury. I mean, who can afford 200,000 a year? Maybe some people who spoke here, which is fine. I, like my, many of my friends, prefer to age in place. In short, I'm prepared to sacrifice a lot. Deprivation of sunshine, increase in traffic, sleep quality because of ambulances and commotion at midnight, 30 feet from where we sleep, the noise of service trucks to Amica's building every morning and cars all day, prepared to, to sacrifice. But the building should not be, should be not be more than 69 feet. And it should be terraced as well. The sixth story, as we, as we saw, on 41st Avenue, continuation of this site is 69 feet, and it's terraced, five feet, four feet, six stories, five stories, and then three stories. I also want to say something about the 
saving the trees. It's not cutting the trees and then just planting trees. These are very special trees. We have some of the oldest trees in Vancouver. For example, we have a Gary oak tree. Less than 1% now, less than 1% of the, of the low elevation Gary oak habitat remain in Canada today. This makes the Gary oak ecosystem one of the most endangered in Canada. Besides, if M. Carril still insists on this super tall building, they can use technology. We have in UBC, for example, Professor Lorne Whitehead, who is super duper specialist worldwide on light and mirrors. We can make these special cuts, put mirrors, and so on, and then we can use technology, but they have to invest in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Okay, uh, now uh, speaker 13, Mark Williams. Mark? Thank you very much. Your honorable councillors and the acting mayor, thank you for providing an opportunity to speak today. I'm aligned with adding more homes, adding more homes for seniors. I'm in favor of development and growth. Reading through the comments on the City of Vancouver website for opposed and in favor, I noticed that the in favor was in favor for seniors housing, which I am as well, but I put myself down as opposed. I'm opposed to the tremendous size and massing of the building. Those that are in favor didn't mention anything about the building size, large shadow, or taking neighborhood trees down. The debate for me and I believe for the application is about the form and allowable building type, the height most specifically, the massing, size, and impact of such a large building on the current and future neighborhood. It's not a debate over seniors housing. Uh, we can have both, seniors housing and a building that integrates appropriately with the community. I want Vancouver to be a livable city. Sunlight should be a paramount consideration. I'm opposed to reducing light to homes and people. Neighboring trees should be kept and not remo removed. I'm opposed to cutting trees down on neighboring properties. Green spaces should be provided. I'm opposed to minimizing green spaces. My property, including possible future multi-development on our property, as with others, the board of the development is significantly negatively impacted. Significant reduction in light. The size of the building together with its east-west orientation will block much of the site light for many months of the year. The bordering property depths are shorter than typical Vancouver lots, making the building size more impactful, only allowing limited light during certain months of the year. Trees cut down. Larger trees with mature canopies on our own properties are planned to be cut down. Limited setbacks. The proposed building has varied setbacks that create a very imposing wall for certain properties, including my own. As a builder myself, having worked and built projects in Vancouver, I know of many projects where the city has, green spaces are maintained through setbacks, trees are retained to maintain the nature of birds and animals, light to surrounding properties is maintained by not only a lower height, but also stepping buildings back at different levels and providing breaks in the building. Larger buildings are broken up as not to create a massive wall without any opportunity for light to pass through. The city has always been, and should continue to be, a leader and strong advocate for each of these. Light, green spaces, and trees, a more livable city. Buildings in the downtown core are always scrutinized based on the degree of shadows and consideration of view corridors. This has created the downtown we see today, taller, more slender buildings, as opposed to shorter rectangular blocks, a more livable city. All homes have setbacks for green spaces, front, side, back, more livable city. Trees are retained and prioritized. They're protected during any construction process. So much so, it's a requirement that the city arborist oversees work around trees. Again, more livable city. These are and should continue to be cornerstones of all development in the city, regardless of use. In fact, many of these same guidelines and parameters are in place at the newly constructed development right next door, 41st and Collywood. This project at 41st and Blenheim should be no different. Please, I respectfully ask that we work to reduce the building height 
allow current and future neighbors to have the light, to live in light, provide more green spaces, more appropriate setbacks, and save our trees to create a livable city with communities for all. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, speaker number 14, Rebecca Hartley. Rebecca Hartley. Hello, um, hi Chair Fry and City Council. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hartley. I'm a resident of Vancouver and I'm here this evening to voice my support for these West 41st Avenue and Blenheim Street homes. This location is really great for residents as they can make an easy trip to the nearby grocery store for daily staples or can hop on the R4 to connect to other areas of the city. This bus stop will also allow staff members, family and friends a simpler commute and should help assuage any concerns about increases in traffic. The building itself is thoughtfully designed as it's made to look like a group of smaller structures instead. The grounds are well landscaped and will even result in a net increase of trees from what exists today. The green roof and outdoor terraces will not just be visibly attractive for neighbours, but will offer residents and their guests a space to walk through and connect with nature, or a beautiful space to sit and chat the time away. On those warm and sunny days, there's even covered outdoor spaces that offer some shade. Turning to the building's interior, there's a lot of amenities too. During the day, residents can get some exercise in the fitness room or the pool, uh, connect with friends in the games room, or have a quiet moment to themselves in the library. They won't even have to go out to have a nice night out, and they can host a get-together in the private dining area, catch a movie in the theater, or enjoy a chat with friends at the fireplace lounge. And this is just on the main floor. Each level offers us place, places to gather, take in activities, or just sit and watch TV. It's clear this proposal will be a great addition to the community, as it will allow those that already live here a chance to age in place. With the shortage of these types of homes, those in the city at large will also have the opportunity to remain close to the places and people they've built their lives with and maintain these important connections. Given this, I hope you will join me tonight and support this project. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Your number 15, Devin Hussack. Hi, Devin. <coughs> Hello there, Chair Fry. Uh, I see Mary Sims not in chambers today. Uh, the rest of City Council. Uh, my name is Devin Hussock. I'm a resident and homeowner in Vancouver. And I'm here tonight largely because of the values my parents instilled in me as I grew up. I know the merits of community service of leaving the world a better place than we found it, and the responsibility of ensuring our elders are well looked after. I believe this application will ensure these duties are met, and that's why I'm here speaking in support of it. As I watch my timer tick up, I was going to say down, but I guess it's ticking up, uh, I'm reminded that time waits for no one, and that these homes and services will come too late for many people. Already this proposal has spent 15 months in this rezoning review, and even if you approve it tonight, it will face far more months of scrutiny to secure the development permit to say nothing of the construction process. That means it could be another five years before its doors open, assuming it follows the timeline of a similar yet slightly smaller elder care building at 2499 West 48th Avenue. I find that troubling, and I know you all must too. It's clear that previous city councils have failed in their core duties. That doesn't mean you have to continue the sad legacy. Simply saying one supports letting people age in place isn't enough. We need to provide options to let them remain in the community they love. While children can help clean a home or fix a meal, it robs our parents of their independence, and it fails to address the dangers that living in a detached dwelling can pose. A fall on a wet or icy concrete step can break the bones. A slip on a carpeted staircase inside the house can prove fatal. These homes will let our loved ones enjoy their golden years in a way that's safe, preserves their dignity, and frankly comes with some pretty cool amenity spaces. It also ensures a couple that has been married for decades won't have to split as the ravages of their age take their toll. As, at worst, they'll be able to find their other half just a short elevator ride on a floor that can provide them the care, security, and stability they all need. Of course, that comes with some trade-offs, but this building can't be viewed in the same lens as the rental buildings that have been approved immediately to its east and to its west. 
With the demands for oxygen and other medical services, this is more like a hospital, meaning its heights and length must be judged on a different scale. Then again, by the time it's finished, the new provincial housing legislation mean, it may mean that this building is barely noticeable amongst a forest of 8 and 12 story buildings. Certainly, its design team have helped with that goal, of being unnoticeable, that is. Rather than craft something flashy to satisfy their egos, they presented, presented something that's been muted. It's broken up in a way that will make the passengers on the R4 that go by struggle to realize it is actually one building instead of three separate ones. Even pedestrians might have that challenge with the dozens of new trees that will ensure it will only be a matter of a few seasons before this building is hidden away from view. However, that lasting legacy of making West 4th, 41st Avenue a more pleasant street to walk along won't fade away. It won't just benefit these residents, but the entire neighborhood as well. After all, who will need to drive anywhere when there's a save on foods a block to the east, to the west, sorry? Even if you don't need a shopping trip, previous generations knew entertainment value that, that comes with people watching long before we signed into things like YouTube and TikTok. Suffice to say, between these local stores and the nearby Dunbar bus loop, I doubt many residents or care workers here will choose to drive. There's better ways to enjoy life than being stuck in traffic. My mom was a care aide, and I know the drive home after a long, tiring shift was one of her fa at least favorite parts of her day, even more so when she was grieving a loss of a resident she was close with. Wow, I think if she were still here, or still around, she would be flabbergasted that we were even having this meeting. My dad, on the other hand, might enjoy a dark laugh over the condition of approval that suggests exploring burying this building several feet in the ground. Are we really that eager to discard our senior population so quickly? It's obvious I wish my parents could have had the opportunity to enjoy growing old together in a residence like this. I trust Amica is a good provider of these services, as you've already endorsed that view when you approved several previous rezoning applications in other parts of the city. Dunbar's elderly citizens deserve that same opportunity, freedom, and quality of care these devel those developments will provide. Still, we need to find ways to expedite these type of homes. People literally can't afford to wait for them. Eventually, we all run out of time. So before my timer beeps to let me know I'm done here, let me again ask you that you approve these homes and find a better way to handle proposals like this in the future to ensure our loved ones see the better tomorrow that we're all making here together. Thank you for your time. Thanks, David. And you didn't run out of time, so... Yes, just... <laughs> all right. Speaker number 16 is Christina Shorthouse. Hi, Christina. Good evening, uh, Acting Mayor and Councillors. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name is Christina Shorthouse, and I'm here to speak in support of the proposed facility. Um, I'm a resident of Dunbar. I live right across from the community centre, and, um, and I'm also here as a member of the so-called sandwich generation, which I'm guessing some of you are as well. Um, I have been the primary caregiver to my two kids, who very much enjoyed the community centre, lots of programming for kids there, and also to my mum, who is here tonight. I think she's up there. Um, so, like many Gen Xers, it's sheer luck of timing that we actually got into the real estate, Vancouver real estate market when we did. We moved to Dunbar in 2007 when my youngest was a year old. It is very unlikely that she will have a chance to own real estate in this market. And um, we are eternally grateful for the privilege of having been able to raise our kids in um, this community. Um, so my mom, uh, just to put a face to some of these potential seniors who would be moving into Amica. She cared for my dad, uh, who suffered from dementia for two years, until he passed away in 2017. And at the age of 80, she made the courageous decision to uproot herself from her uh, community in Ontario, um, where she lived her whole life, to come to Vancouver to be closer to me and my kids and start a new chapter of her life. Um, while she does see me and the kids, of course, she has had to work really hard to find a wider community. Dunbar is sadly lacking in services, programs, and spaces to connect with other seniors. I um, love the community of fellow uh, newcomers. She has found after much effort and advocacy, a lot of them are here tonight and have spoken. Um, 
And uh, it's a big deal for them to venture out on an evening after dinner, so we're grateful that they're here to share their really important perspectives. So now at 88, my mom's doing amazing, um, touch wood, thankfully, but she is a planner and she knows that at some point she might not feel up to cooking, might need a break from things like laundry and other housework. Apartment living, as we know, can be lonely and uh, so she might want to be somewhere where she can just go downstairs and find a game of bridge or someone to meet up with to share a meal or a gin and tonic. Um, so according to Statistics Canada in Southwest Vancouver, Vancouver, there are 2,000 elders in her category, 85 plus, and 6,065 to 85. That's triple uh, the number of seniors coming down the pipeline. Fellow sandwichers like me total 16,000, and 62% of those are women. So the lack of facilities and services for seniors not only impacts the seniors themselves, but also their primary caregivers. It is real and largely ignored. Everyone wants what's best for their families, of course, but it's hard to watch when their needs and dignity are ignored if, in the worst case scenario, mom's need for services becomes urgent. One of the key values of private pay operators is that they offer immediate relief to those families who are in a health or housing crisis, either stuck in hospital or uh, can't return home or stuck in an inadequate current housing situation and need an immediate solution. Mom and her friends have been meaningfully engaged in consult uh, the consultation process for this facility uh, over the year, as they should be. They're a really important stakeholder in this conversation. Because of their efforts and engagement, Amica has added a gathering space in its plans that would be open to the larger community. This important group of seniors has felt listened to, something that happens far too infrequently in their lives. So just as there is an urgent need for quality child care, there's an equal need for quality elder care and supportive neighborhoods to age well in community. Vancouver desperately needs an age equitable strategy. Um, and just to wrap up, we are a wonderful community in Dunbar, full of amazing folks committed to community, but we are also part of a major city and we must make up for years of fighting, building anything but single family homes. Um, I am very open to the option uh, being right on Dunbar of bring it on, whatever you want to build there, bring it on. My neighbors might disagree, but I'm realistic that I'm on a major artery and that's what needs to happen. Um, uh, just because we are fortunate enough or wealthy enough to get into this market doesn't mean that we should unilaterally get to decide who also gets to benefit from living here. Dunbar has um, parks and green spaces galore, including specific Pacific Spirit Park, so it's been a luxury to have a backyard too. So I would use that word in the terms of how we've been able to leave, live so far and share that. So finally, uh, cities are living organisms that need to adapt and change or they will die. We see this happening already in Dunbar in the shuttered businesses and declining enrollment in Little League. We need to remove laws and regulations that try to freeze communities in time so they can't adapt or change to meet future needs of the community. We are facing a combined housing and climate climate crisis, we need to build more spaces for folks to live, and the seniors facility is desperately needed and should be built as soon as possible. Thanks for seeing <coughs> extra time there because you're on. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. Uh, our final speaker on the list is speaker number 17, Peter Dowdy. On the phone? Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, my name is Peter Dowdy, and I'm a resident of Vancouver and a member of the Vancouver Area Neighbors Association. I'm calling in to strongly support this proposal. Canada is getting older, and the west side of Vancouver particularly so. As the applicant made abundantly clear, seniors in Vancouver are facing a major demographic crisis as they try to age in place in their communities, communities which have underbuilt housing for decades. So uh, an application like this is absolutely critical. This is going to allow hundreds of seniors who otherwise would not be able to stay in their communities to stay, and it will keep families together. But we need another dozen applications like this, and we need those applications years ago, which is why it's so frustrating to me uh, that the Urban Design Panel has imposed all of these compromises on this one. These setbacks just increase the cost to build. They take away square footage that could be used to house people. 
the facade articulation is just an invitation to moisture encroachment, higher maintenance, and possible negative health consequences for residents. And have, has, have we really suggested that the applicant, quote, explore lowering of the building into the ground, end quote? Is that really how we want to design the residences for our seniors? The most egregious to me, though, is that is the request to remove two meters of height from the building and to save that space by economizing on mechanical equipment, which I understand consists mostly of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. In the aftermath of the heat dome tragedy, are we really going to try to economize on seniors' air conditioning in order to reduce the visual impacts of this building? So I ask you to approve this proposal, and I ask you to give seniors their two meters back. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Peter. All right. Well, this is the third and final call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll-free. One. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I'll, I'll give you a minute. Just, thank you. Um, if anybody would like to speak to council, please call toll-free. 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND before the close of the speakers list. That phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium. We're going to take a five-minute recess first to allow folks to come to speak. We'll come back in five minutes, sir, and then you'll be allowed to speak. Okay. Five minutes. Oh, great.
No meetings. <sighs> Let's go. All right, it looks like we have quorum folks, so we're going to reconvene uh, and uh, asking the clerk if we have any speakers on the phone. I know th this gentleman would like to say some words. Clerk, do we have anybody waiting on the phone? Uh, no speakers on the line. No speakers on the line. Okay, so last of our in-person speakers. Okay. And please uh, introduce yourself and let us know if that, that might Does it need to be an adjustment? Yeah, we can have the, the podium raised a bit for you. And please let us know uh, your name and if you're... Okay, my name is Mr. Um, Vaughn Evans. I'm 75 and I was born in St. Paul's Hospital and I spent most of my life in or near the heart of Carousel and I'm now living in Marpole. Thanks, Vaughn. Okay, please go. Okay, ahead. now I, I, to a certain extent I agree with, with, with um, most of what people said. However, I do take exception when they say um, people have to be um, shifted because sometimes uh, there are various categories of, um, uh, of um, care for seniors and disabled, and I'm in a category which is called semi-independent living, where I uh, um, do my uh, shopping and uh, and because they disabled my stove, I take meals down to be cooked, although I do have a toaster and, and microwave and coffee um, maker. Um, um, the truth is the reason why people need to be shifted because sometimes they need more or less care depending on what they're recovering or how they're aggressing. I, I might mention that that um, I lived on U Street for 12 years until we had I had bed bugs and I was affected. And the Pacific Legal Education Organization, also called PLE, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, found me a home on Euclid Street. But I, but I uh, uh, had a disagreement uh, 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 with him because he uh, quest the, the the husband questioned my sexual preference, so I ran away all night in anger, and then they found me a new uh, 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 place with a woman where we did some fun things together, and then they, in August 2017, they found me a place on Hudson Street where we have people with various disabilities, which include having had a stroke, and they need help with housekeeping because uh, they don't have full use uh, of their um, hands. I, I might mention that we in, in Canada should be darn lucky that we get um, uh, practically free um, uh, uh, health care. A person living in a modern democracy like Canada, Britain, and United States gets more services from their government than than um, than um, any uh, um, people who have ever lived anywhere. It's true that there there's some waiting lists for <coughs> services, but th that's well, excuse me, just one sec, because we only have limited time, and I want to bring you back to this this application because you'll run out of time before you get to the application that we're talking about. Okay, well, here's something I will uh, uh, conclude by saying. It's been a pleasure being a resident of Vancouver. So uh, as for you city councillors, you keep doing your fine work with the assurance that I'll treat you and the other people who work f for our fair city with every respect. Thanks, Vaughn. Did you have any more to say on the, on the project? Uh, what, you, you, you mean on the character homes? No, on, on, on this particular development for Amica that they're proposing at 41st and Blenheim. Uh, um, uh, 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 well, well, I, well, I might say that the only place you can go um, is, is uh, up, and, and the trouble is uh, why do most of the people in, in BC have to live in uh, the lower mainland? Our province is as, uh, as, as big as Washington and Oregon and California put together, but those three uh, states together have about 51 million, and BC has five and a half uh, 
uh, million. Um, it, 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 many old people might like to live in a small place where they could keep a garden and, and maybe keep some chickens because some people when they retire take on additional interests. Excellent point. Thanks, Vaughn. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, anybody else to speak to this item or can we close the speakers list? All right, seeing that there are no additional speakers, then the speakers list is now closed. Uh, and seeing as there are little no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm now also closing the receipt of public comments. Uh, seeing no, okay, so uh, does the applicant have any closing comments? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Acting Mayor and members of Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, have a few closing remarks. Uh, my name is Derek Koss. Uh, I'm with Amica uh, Senior Lifestyles as the Chief Development Officer. Uh, it's our company's mission to serve seniors, their families, and the greater community. Prior to any submission and throughout the development application process, Emica takes great care to deliver the right proposal to the neighborhoods we would like to serve as a good community neighbor and senior living housing and care provider. To achieve this, we know that uh, this will involve community engagement uh, and we openly and respectfully engage the community. Uh, we do so by making ourselves available for dialogue, listening to feedback and reporting uh, and responding to concerns. As you heard, our team engaged the immediate neighbors and the broader community for close to two years. We consider all views and responded with an amended design that is an effective compromise. We have carved building mass away from the neighbors uh, on the north side, lowered the building height by seven feet, and we've done so while still maintaining the design standards required to deliver a safe and congregate uh, living environment. I wanted to say in response to the uh, comments on the height that we spent a lot of time uh, with three different engineers looking at the building height to try to compress the building as much as we could to address those concerns. Um, uh, we were able to do that um, through um, uh, a great deal of time and, and effort and reducing by seven feet may not sound uh, significant to some, but what I would say to you is that we are as compressed in the overall height of the building as we can be to still deliver a safe congregate care environment. Um, and that overall, some other considerations that are very important is that seniors uh, need a coplanar environment, um, meaning that you know, steps, ramps are difficult. And so the structure is slightly deeper because of that. So that balconies are coplanar with interior spaces uh, and that uh, as we step the building back, that required some additional structure. So that's all within that height that we've been talking about. Um, I would also just like to uh, thank um, everyone that spoke tonight, uh, both for and against, uh, and just wanted to say to, to mayor and council that this is a very important moment in terms of delivering seniors uh, what they need, and that's senior housing. Uh, and I would like to just close by saying there's no need for us to keep seniors and their families waiting. Let's get right to it together, starting today. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, staff, any closing comments? No? Okay. All right, uh, this is an opportunity for council to ask questions of staff. Note that we've done the asking questions of the applicants, so strictly for staff. Councilor Carr. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, Steph, I, I'm interested in um, in the issue around the shadowing on the north side, and um, I'm looking at Appendix G of this report, um, the form of development drawings, and um, in particular the site plan and landscape plan. And I, I wonder if you could talk me through or help me understand um, the where the shadowing impacts are going to be reduced by this plan. Um, I'm seeing some, it looks like ground level green space indentations into the building site. I, you know, it's, it's hard to tell for me exactly, but can you walk me through where you anticipate the shadowing on north side um, homes across the other side of the lane um, will be the greatest and what has been reduced 
by the building form being shaped the way it is. Right. So the um, the shadow studies are not included within Appendix G. So I think the first image that you're looking at uh, in the Appendix G is the site plan. Right. So the shadows are cast to the north uh, of this building, across the lane, to the backyards, and sometimes uh, to the houses to the north. So the, the actual shadow study is not here. I mean, I can uh, bring it up and share on the screen um, if, if, if that's desired, and I just need a little bit of time to, to do right, that. This is the closest I got to under, trying to understand the shadows. So um, uh, maybe you can give me the verbal description then of the shadowing. Is it... Uh, is it Primarily, um, I, my understanding in the winter, and um, yeah. Just uh, hello, um, I can I can answer that question. Um, so, in most of the time during the year, around ten a.m. all the way to noon and two p.m. is the times that we look at. Yes. And um, at some, uh, it is acknowledgeable that uh, because of the location of the site, there is some. Um, shadowing impact on the neighbors uh, that is anticipated. Um, however, um, there are uh, times that par partially uh, shadows are on the backyards and, some, and partially they are not shadowing. Um, um, it is uh, during early in the day and later in the afternoon there's more shadowing, but closer to noon there's less shadowing. Mm. But that is just changes throughout the year, but um, yes. Mm. That's so, the way I can yeah. answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the width of the lane, I mean, is the, does that make any difference? Uh, what the difference that the lane makes is that the building is pushed to uh, limits towards the south. Correct, yeah. Uh, and that uh, technically helps with lowering the shadowing because of the, the, the distance it makes, but, um, but the lane itself uh, does not impact. No, it's just that it's... Yes, it just building pushes the building. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. I might have more questions, but that's it for me for now. Thank you. That's it for you? Yep. Okay. Uh, Councillor Meisner. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, my question is for staff, and it's really just more of a clarification. I heard a comment uh, earlier that uh, up to eight stories would be allowed here due to the location's proximity uh, to the Dunbar uh, bus loop. Uh, as well as being on a rapid transit uh, route. Is that uh, correct that eight stories would be um, allowed here under the new TOA legislation? Well, so I guess it's a bit of a nuanced, <laughs> excuse me, nuanced answer to the question. There's not a rezoning policy in the that exists currently that would allow for that, but the provincial bill that was introduced identifies uh, TOAs and the bus, Dunbar bus loop is one of those TOAs. And um, that envisions the, per the bill that they could build up to uh, eight stories and three FSR. But as I mentioned, there's no rezoning policy to allow for that. That's just general direction coming from the province. Yeah, but we are expecting um, updated uh, policies uh, for these areas uh, near these rapid transit or uh, bus loops, correct? I believe that they're reporting back in June or so to uh, let you know how, how that's being addressed. Okay, so in terms of the height of this building, um, it, it is six stories, but obviously the, the ceiling heights are higher for the HVAC, et cetera. Is that about an equivalent to an eight-story building? Yeah, so um, the overall height is 85 feet, which is equivalent to an eight-story typical residential building, noting that this building is an institutional building, not a typical residential building. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks very much. That's all my questions. Great. Thanks, Councillor Meisner. <clears throat> uh, I've added myself to the queue, actually. I just had a, a quick question about the trees. It seems uh, somewhat unusual to me the extent of private property trees that are being uh, sort of uh, removed for this project. And I'm gathering, I'm assuming this is because of the lane. Maybe there's not an existent lane there. And can you just walk me through what that's going to look like and how I think Dr. Ward mentioned a Gary Oak tree there, which is quite mm -hmm. rare for yeah yeah the trees have been an interesting conversation through this one so there is no back lane there at the moment so part of the requirements of uh that engineering requires is a, a dedication of a 20-foot lane on the along the north side of the property um so recognizing that further design work needs to be done with regards to the engineering of that lane and understand exactly what is needed um as a 
condition of, uh, of development permit, we would look to have a, a certified arborist report that would identify which trees are impacted by the, the lane. And um, as per, I think, condition 1.8 in there, that there needs to be resolution on the neighboring trees by, between the applicant and the neighbors uh, before development permit is issued. Okay, so there is some potential flexibility that we're talking about as far as the, I guess the lane width is lane width, but the trees may... That's going to be determined through the further design development at the development permit stage. And so when, when the applicant comes in with the DP, or if they you know, provide and they get approved tonight, they would, they would need to submit, they would do further drawings on their, engi their engineering drawings to figure out exactly what is impacted and seek the advice of a certified arborist at that point to determine how to deal with those trees. And if those trees are impacted, if the neighboring trees are impacted, then the applicant will have to... Uh, speak to the, those neighbors and try to figure out how they are going to deal with those trees. Hey, that's clear as mud. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, seeing no uh, further comments from, or questions from uh, council, council are gonna now make a decision on the application. Uh, do we have a mover for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Dominato, seconded by Councillor Klassen. Um, is there any debate? See Councillor Klassen on the queue. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, uh, and uh, thank you to all the speakers that we heard from uh, this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, uh, Council for allowing us to have some of the uh, uh, this item move to the beginning to allow for some speakers like uh, uh, Betty Thompson, who uh, led us off today um, and uh, uh, told told us about uh, her work at the Dunbar Seniors Cafe, which. I hope I can uh, come and visit you sometime uh, there. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge. Oh. Uh, I think that uh, we are in a um, uh, sort of a, a shifting paradigm in terms of the uh, amount of new housing that we're, we are building, um, and uh, uh, especially along our arterials. And um, as so many speakers uh, tonight uh, really clearly laid out is the uh, lack of uh, housing availability for seniors uh, in particular uh, is an absolute uh, necessity uh, for, for this area. Um, uh, I was just, just kind of going through and really struck by some of the comments from the speakers that um, uh, really took hold to me. I was thinking of Stephanie Chan talking about the incredible importance of, of care planning. Uh, we know that there are so many people who are um, uh, really um, uh, not ready for um, for the, the the demographic shift that we're looking at right now. Um, uh, Effie Taylor, who gave a, a very impassioned uh, description of what the life of a family caregiver is like and how incredibly important it is that we have this housing close by in neighborhoods so families can be kept together and not have to be sent to the periphery of our of our of our city um, just to be able to uh, uh, lead out those important sort of uh, later years of their life and then uh, again so many other really great um, uh, comments from our speakers, but I, I do want to acknowledge the work uh, of the applicant, um, uh, you know, dropping the seven feet. The, the, the claims around the height just don't compute for me. I have now looked at enough um, development applications uh, in my role as a counselor to understand that uh, every, every additional inch of, uh, of height and space in a building is co additional cost, and uh, it doesn't make sense to me that there would be um, a, a willingness to try and just uh, uh, having height for height's sake. Uh, but I also know that during COVID, um, that um, it was so clear uh, at a point that um, that it was an airborne disease and it was so incredibly important that um, uh, seniors uh, facilities in particular uh, were the most uh, impacted by um, poor circulation and poor air conditions and that having systems in there that will improve that is absolutely vital. vital. Um, I just want to just uh, uh, close by um, uh, recalling my my friend, um, uh, the late great uh, May Brown, who is a 
former city councilor, former, former park commissioner, and, and one time uh, candidate for mayor. And uh, uh, everybody remembers uh, uh, May for her being uh, probably not much taller than five feet tall, but having the incredible uh, presence and power as an individual. She was one of the founders of the Dunbar Residence Association and very, very uh, pivotal in terms of uh, working to try and uh, make that neighborhood um, a, a wonderful and uh, uh, highly livable part of our city. Um, uh, when May passed away, she had to move out of the neighborhood because there was no available seniors housing in Dunbar for her to go to at the time. And so I was thinking that if May were uh, here today and were able to come to speak to us, she would be asking for for uh, this council to do much more work to get more seniors housing built in our city. And um, uh, just the fact alone that there are so many waiting lists on so many different uh, um, housing, um, uh, seniors housing uh, developments around the city is a clear indication to me that uh, both private and public have to row together to try and make sure that we meet this incredible growing demand in our city. So um, uh, I look forward to uh, supporting this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, I, uh, as as some folks uh, in the room know, uh, grew up just two blocks from this location, down on 43rd and Blenheim. Um, this intersection was where I caught the bus to high school and then where I caught the bus out to UBC. I spent many, many, many rainy, long uh, days, hours uh, there. Um, I'm I'm very familiar with the area, and as I too have been listening to speakers, I just have um, thought so much about what it would have meant to my family if my either of my grandmothers would have been able to find uh, stable, uh, uh, continuous care housing in the neighborhood close to where we were, um, so we would have been able to visit, so that my mother would have been. Uh, and father would have been near them to take care of them. I'm so really glad to see us um, looking to build more uh, more seniors housing in this neighborhood and really all across the city. Um, I appreciate the speakers. I appreciate, especially appreciated hearing um, from the the family whose children too would be able to visit their grandparents in the neighborhood and um, the recognition of the need for much more housing like this. So. Uh, Glad to support it here and um, and hope we continue to see the seniors housing units that we know we need uh, being built across the city. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Meisner. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, very grateful uh, to hear uh, tonight from neighbours and also uh, from residents uh, who came out to speak uh, or called in uh, illustrating the huge need uh, for seniors housing here in Vancouver. Um, I think we can all agree that there is a huge shortage of seniors housing, uh, not just in our city, but across the province. And with the demographic changes that we're seeing, uh, that's going to get worse. Um, I can speak from a bit of personal experience uh, being involved uh, with my OMA's uh, move to long-term care uh, in uh, several years ago um, in uh, Chilliwack. Uh, we could not find uh, an a single uh, available long-term care room in the entire city of Chilliwack. Um, so the only option was to move her to Agassiz. And that was really challenging uh, for her. Um, it was a 30 to 45 minute drive uh, for my aunts who were her primary caregivers um, and still went to visit her regularly when she was in long-term care and also to be separated from her communities. So I think with this project, it will allow people that uh, currently live uh, in the neighborhood uh, to stay in the neighborhood and age in place. And I think that's so important, especially in uh, later years. So I realize that uh, these are high-end uh, seniors homes, but I really believe that we need a variety of options in the market uh, to help alleviate the crunch. And obviously we need uh, many more projects of all levels of affordability and council and, and myself and the mayor will continue to advocate for and support seniors housing across the spectrum. And that includes affordable seniors housing uh, supported by government subsidies. So I also wanted to add um, that I do believe that the applicant has done a good job addressing some of the concerns that have been raised today, uh, whether that's uh, adding setbacks on the fifth and sixth stories to reduce some of the shadowing issues, um, as well as ensuring that any issues around traffic, loading or garbage collection that come up uh, will be addressed. 
Um, this is a, a, a good operator, in my opinion, uh, and a, a responsible applicant that does good work. And I am convinced that this will be a positive addition to the neighborhood. Um, and I'm looking forward to supporting this application. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And uh, before I move to the next name on the queue, I just want to point out to Council that we did uh, just receive uh, additional correspondence from David Yim uh, that were received after 5 p.m. And I was supposed to ask for that. Uh, David went ahead and submitted it. Thank you, David, wherever you are. Uh, now, uh, Councillor Joe. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I, I will be brief. So I'd like to support this project. I think this project aligns with uh, Vancouver's long-term vision of the uh, sustainable development uh, as outlined in Vancouver plan, as, as well as the provincial Bill 47. It also addressed the growing needs for the senior care facility within the community to support our aging population. Uh, I'm very confident that this development will contribute to the vibrancy of the Denver neighborhood, which has seen a population decrease in recent years by uh, repurposing the underutilized space and providing essential amenities to our seniors within the working or walking distance of local shops and the transit. You know, of course, it will alleviate the pressure in our healthcare system, which is also very important. Uh, I also want to appreciate the applicant's effort in accommodating the request from the community by adjusting the height by seven feet, also adding the setback. So about the shattering, I, I understand it's the concern, but uh, you know, when I look at uh, the information online, the on City of Vancouver's website, on the uh, applic applicant boards, uh, there's a presentation on page 28. It actually you know, describes uh, what is the shadow from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at uh, Equinox uh, in spring and fall. Uh, I think uh, if you look at that study, very detailed uh, evaluation there is pretty positive. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'm going to support uh, this project. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I think I'm at risk of being a bit repetitive, but I do have a few comments. Um, I, I do want to thank um, all of the speakers. Um, I really appreciated um, the commentary about this proposal, um, uh, both those who were in support and those who were opposed. Um, I think it was a really thoughtful dialogue, and, and everyone shared their thoughts respectfully. I appreciated um, um, the really heartfelt um, comments that were made about uh, trying to adapt in our city, and particularly, um, you know, one of the speakers referred to being that sandwich generation and trying to support children, but also support um, elder parents, and uh, the critical importance of trying to stay connected, and particularly um, not just simply aging in place for their parents, but able to stay connected in their families. And so I really appreciated that point, and um, I think it really spoke to um, an issue my colleagues have already uh, touched on, which is um, based on the demographic trend and then the actual availability of housing and care, um, there's, a, there's a clear gap uh, from what we're seeing. And so um, this isn't the panacea, but this proposal and project will help address some of that gap, and particularly for residents who are living in the Dunbar area. And so I, I, I think that um, it's already been said, the statistics are shared, but um, there's certainly a need here. Um, and, the, and the other aspect that was touched on on, um, and highlighted in, in some of the feedback that uh, was provided in terms of some of the initial engagement around this was um, the lack of services. So I found it quite interesting that there's some uh, very intentional effort to work with the community to address some of those service gaps, but also that's part of the housing continuum. So here you've talked, you've got a continuum of care that's being offered through this housing, but also um, that sense of community and socialization because uh, as we age, we, increasingly there's a risk of isolation. And I've seen this with um, my family members. I've seen both the issue of trying to find housing and care um, with grandparents um, and also isolation with other members of my family. And so uh, that's a really critical piece. And I still have, um, uh, remember my mother uh, when she was still alive, she used to, she had a fantastic singing voice, which I didn't inherit, but she used to actually go into homes and sing and be part of that fabric of community. Uh, and so I think that's really powerful. And I think that will be a, a part of this as I hear about some of the activations that will be part of the um, housing. Um, so I think I'll just leave it there, um, but um, I am going to be supporting this project and appreciate everyone who did come out and speak, um, and I'll, I'll wrap up there. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. And Councillor Carr. 
I was going to talk about my mother, too, who also had a great singing voice and played the piano. Um, uh, and it was very, very hard on us when we realized that um, uh, she was in a, in a facility that was not continuous care to the end. And um, so aging in place became a, a huge source of stress for us. And luckily, um, the facility allowed us to bring in private nursing care, um, which made the difference. So she didn't have to move, but I don't think that happens everywhere. Um, so uh, aging in place is incredibly important. Aging in community is important, and we heard a lot of those stories. Um, being able to be close to where other family members and friends um, uh, lived. So um, those two are, are significant issues that, that are important in my decision uh, to support this project. Um, I, I have got concerns around um, shadowing, uh, um, and it, it's a hard one for me because I do believe in the quality of life that's aided by sunlight, um, and we do have uh, rules around shadowing um, for a number of buildings on public space, but not on private space. Um, so uh, that's that's a tough one. Uh, but uh, I see that there is, you know, there's been some attempt to um, to mitigate um, the shadowing which I think is important. Um, trees, too, are important to me, especially with climate change and the fact that shadowing, uh, sorry, the shadows cast by trees actually has been important in mitigating the effects of a heating planet. And um, so I, I, I'm super proud that the city has a one-for-one -one tree replacement policy. So um, there are going to, but of course, they're going to be little to begin with. They will not provide a lot of shadow for a number of years. My hope is that there's certainly going to be attention paid to the kind of species that will survive into 50, 80, 100, 200 years, um, which is by what Metro Vancouver staff are telling us um, who are doing some of this research should be trees more like southern well, northern at least California, maybe even Southern California. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to be paying attention to the long-term um, uh, sustainability of those trees, I think, is really important. Anyway, they, I just want to thank the speakers very much for coming out and speaking. It was a passionate group. Everybody was very articulate. And, um, yeah. It impacted, you know, certainly how I feel about the project, um, both in terms of some concerns and um, and in terms of the support that I'm going to provide. Great. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, seeing no further comments from Council, I'm going to move us to a voting queue. Uh, Clerk, if we could set that up, please. Right, and that passes with uh, none opposed. Okay, so according to my script, it's now time to, what? No, it's not time to adjourn. We've varied the agenda, so, ha, ah, ah. ha. Back to uh, item number one, folks. Item number one. <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day here at Council. Do we need, do we need a quick recess? Let's dive right into it. Okay. Councillor Klassen. Chair, I'm going to um, just uh, going to suggest that um, with the exception of one item that has quite a few speakers, which is item five, um, and I'll just start with this one, that we um, that I, that I move to uh, waive the presentation and, and uh, yeah. So waiving the presentation for item number one? Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll dive in. Thank you, Councillor Klassen. Uh, can I get a seconder from Councillor Carr? All in favor of waiving the presentation? Okay. Any opposed? Aye. Seeing none. Oh, sorry. Nobody opposed? Okay. Great. Okay, item number one, 998 Thurlow Street, Heritage Revitalization Agreement and Heritage Designation. Uh, does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on item number one? Okay, seeing none, uh, the clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. 
This is an application by Alan Endall to add the Heritage Building at 998 Thurlow, known as Washington Court, to the Vancouver Heritage Register and to designate the heritage facades as protected heritage property. The proposed HRA will result in a variance to the Zoning and Development Bylaw to allow for an increase in permitted density on the site. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendations. Five pieces of correspondence and support has been received since it was scheduled for public hearing, and that's up to 5 p.m. today. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND before the close of the speakers list. The phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added at the end of the registered speakers list. Since there are no registered speakers for this item, do we have registered speakers? No. Oh, we have one. Okay, since there is a registered speaker for this item, um, uh, dip, 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 skipping through that. Uh, okay, uh, registered speaker for the item? No. Yep, yeah, hi, Vaughn. Maybe address me as Mr. Evans, the Bronte Devil Home. What is spelling pronounced? B-A-U-G-H-N? B-A-U-G-H-A-N. Okay, great. Okay, so we have voted to waive the presentation. Uh, would the applicant team like to present the application if they're in attendance? We're going to leave it to staff and uh, James to handle that. We're available for questions if there's any. So, okay. Well, we do have the one registered speaker on. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are, uh, and Vaughn, before you start, are there any questions from council to staff or the applicant team, noting that this is the only opportunity for council to ask questions of the applicant? Seeing none. Okay, uh, I'm going to just actually, before we start, Vaughn, I'm just going to read out the second call for speakers. If there are any speakers to this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND. Before the close of the speakers list, the phone number has been posted on X and made available in the live stream. Any speakers in the Council chamber, like yourself, please come forward to the podium before this close of the speakers list. Vaughn and speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. Vaughn, okay. your five minutes, sir. Uh -oh. Is that building there are two classes of heritage buildings, Heritage A um, and Heritage B. What's the first, uh, what, what is the status of that building? So, Vaughn, just, just for clarification, these are, these are comments. You can sort of frame some questions that possibly Council may ask on your behalf, but you have to sort of make comments to the... Okay, I guess, I guess I have to know something about what the status of where I can make um, uh, uh, comments. Uh, like, can I ask this question? Is it a, currently a, a Heritage A or B building? So this is the comment period, but I'll write that down and I'll, I'll make a point of asking on your behalf. Okay. But we, we, it's not a real-time question and answer. This is... Okay, well, I, I will m mention that um, I, I lived in the West End in 1979 and 1980, and I was proud of the way they were able to preserve some um, buildings, and, and I especially like it how in Yale Town, some old buildings have been refurbished, the architects was a homey uh, um, feeling, but I feel that they should preserve the building because it, because it, 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 it prevents the West End from losing its he heritage. And in, in the 1890s, the, wel the wealthy people of Vancouver built homes of Victorian and Edwardian uh, um, architecture. And when the wealthy people began to move in Shaughnessy around 1907, they became uh, rooming houses. Cause Many people living today have happy memories uh, of living in the 
West End. I had a great time when I was living there. In that year, Nelson Street was recently repaved. I used to go out at night and roller skate down it. But can I ask, has it... Does a developer want to demolish that uh, building? I have to know a few facts before I can make a comment. Just comments right now, Vaughn. Pardon me? Only comments right now. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, because I, I think the incentive should be given to um, uh, keep um, uh, um, the building or, and, and possibilities uh, could include residential development or maybe use the building as an office uh, for architects. It's a homey uh, feeling. I can remember um, when, when I required professional help for mental problems, I, I went to a, a bright green house at 1230 Comox. It was a very homey uh, feeling. I because uh, it was some kind of house, you, the atmosphere makes you feel at, at home. Okay, Vaughn, is that it for your comments, or? Uh, yeah, because I, because uh, I, 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 sh I should have read, and maybe next time when I, when I want to speak on a proposed topic, I will call the uh, um, uh, city office to find uh, the nature because to speak on a. Uh, on a motion, I have to know some of the background before I mention the pros and cons, that sort of thing. Totally understandable. So it is posted on the website, and there is usually documentation here available. So just so you know, this is a Heritage B kind of revitalization. So they're, they're keeping the kind of look of the building, and they're modernizing it. And I have lots of memories of the Washington court as well. So, but thank you, Vaughn. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, so we're going to take a five-minute recess for any additional speakers, and we'll come back in five minutes. Thank you.
Tim, did you give her the hairball stuff? All right, folks, that's our five minutes. And uh, we'll get council back online. If you're online, please reactivate your cameras. Oh, look at you guys. Thank you. Okay, we have quorum. Uh, and we do have one speaker on the line, and that is Mike Dillman, who is a resident of Vancouver. Mike, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you a-okay. You got five Perfect. minutes. Perfect, thanks. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Mara and uh, Council. So I know you've got a full agenda tonight, so I'll, I'll keep my comments pretty brief. So, yes, again, my name is Mike Doman, and I live in downtown Vancouver, about a five-minute walk south of the project site, 998 Thurlow. I also work about five minutes walking north of it, so I pass by on a pretty ready basis. Um, Usually I'll pass by on my way home as I'm heading back from work. If I'm on a, a trip to go grab some groceries over towards Davy. Um, so I've noticed the site plenty of times. Um, as a renter in the neighborhood, I'm excited to see that there's a project with secure rental housing being proposed. Um, I think it would be very beneficial to people like myself who live and work in the area. It's a great sort of central location. Uh, easy jaunt down to Robson for shopping, downtown if you work down that direction. Similarly, close distance to um, Sunset Beach, uh, walking to the West End, or, or even anywhere you're trying to get by transit. Uh, Burrard Station really isn't that far, and there's plenty of bus routes in the area. Um, so I think it would be pretty useful for pretty much any purpose if you've, uh, when you've got that many amenities in the area. Um, on a personal note, too, I, I like the fact that the Heritage Preservation is, is a prominent part of this project, and it's nice to see that the Heritage Commission has already passed it unanimously. Um, when you look at the Butterfly Building that's just a little further east, uh, being such a tall, modern building, this serves as a great transition piece and sort of a bulwark against that to, to create some... It maintains the character and the pedestrian scale in the area, with this being just right across the street, effectively, from Nelson Park, which is a popular meeting area. Uh, a lot of people take their dogs there to the dog park. There's a community garden. Um, it's just good to have something there that kind of preserves the neighborhood character. And I think the the previous speaker was kind of alluding to that as, as well. So that's my general thoughts on this. Um, I, I just want to say, again, I'm, I'm supportive of it, and um, I hope uh, you will be as well. So thanks for your time. 
All right. Thank you. Um, all right. That was our third call. Uh, seeing as there are no, clerk, there are no additional speakers on the line. No additional speakers are on the line. Great. Okay. So seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. Uh, and seeing as there are little or no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm now also closing the receipt of public comments. Um, does the applicant have any closing comments? No, thanks. Uh, we're, we're good to go. Great. Staff, any closing comments? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, no closing comments. Okay. Do council have any questions for staff? Councilor Carr. Oh, okay, so we'll just, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, Clerk, did we receive any additional comments since the close of public comments? Uh, no. Okay, uh, so council will now make their decision on the application. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Carr. Do we have a seconder? Second by Councillor Klassen. Uh, is there any debate? Councillor Carr? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I, I really, uh, really appreciate the, the uh, uh, applicant retaining the character building here. I mean, it really is a landmark within the West End. I live in the West End, and I have to say the charm of the West End is the diversity of buildings. We've got the high-rises, we've got very modern, um, uh, and we have the heritage building, which buildings, which give the West End its charm. And so um, I'm very, very grateful for that. The retention of the of of the character features or the heritage features, the rebuilding um, of the sixth floor. You know that's uh, you know fantastic and it's a, sort of original um, format. So just thank you so much for doing this and keeping the West End the most beautiful neighborhood in the world. Great, thank you. I've added myself to the queue uh, just to also thank the applicant for putting this together. Oh. oh, I have to cede the chair to... Oh, well, that's okay, I won't. That's, you know what, I don't need to. I was just gonna thank the applicant, but... I'm happy to take the chair. Oh, oh thank you, Deputy Mayor Bly. Uh, only to say, I just, you know, it's, uh, I have a lot of fond memories from the Washington court, um, hanging out with cute raver girls in the 90s, listening to shoegazer music. I have so many friends who have lived in that building over the years. And, uh, you know, for the last 10 years, seeing it burnt out and empty as it has been, it breaks my heart. And it's, it's great to see this building getting a new life breathed into it and for future generations to enjoy. And it's a handsome building, and I'm really glad to see this project moving ahead, so thank you. Uh, thanks, Deputy Mayor Bly. Uh, seeing no further uh, comments from council, we'll just move right to a voting queue. And that passes with none opposed. Great, thank you. All right. Item number two, miscellaneous amendments, zoning and development bylaw and various other bylaws and land use documents. Does any member of council, oh, Councilor Carr, I see you on the queue. Okay. Uh, does any member of council wish to declare a conflict on, of interest on item two? Okay, seeing none, the clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by the Acting General Manager of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability to amend the Zoning and Development Bylaw and various other bylaws and land use documents. The amendments seek to correct spelling, grammatical and wording errors, update wording, references and terms for accuracy, and align with current writing standards. Also to correct omissions and clarify the intent of regulations. No correspondence has been received on this application since it was referred to public hearing up to 5 p.m. today. Great. Okay. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, this is the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 1061445-POUND, before the close of the speakers list. 
The phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added to the end of the registered speakers list. <clears throat> Since there are no registered speakers, I suggest that we waive the presentation. Can I get a mover? Moved by Councillor Dominato, seconded by Councillor Montague. Uh, all those in favor say yay. Opposed say nay. Uh, the motion carries. <clears throat> all right, are there any questions from council to staff? Seeing none, uh, this is the second call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1 833 353 8610, followed by participant code 106 1445 pound. Before the close of the speakers list, the phone number will be posted on X and available on the live stream. <clears throat> any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium before the close of the speakers list. Speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. Uh, Clerk, do we have any speakers on the line or in chambers? Uh, we have no speakers on the line or in the chamber. Okay. Uh, in that case, this is the third and final call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND before the close of the speakers list. The phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium. We will now take a five-minute recess for any additional speakers.
Okay, council, if we can put those cameras back on and uh, five minutes is up and we have quorum, great. Okay, so uh, clerk, do we have any additional speakers to provide comments on this item? Uh, no additional speakers are on the line. Okay, so seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. And seeing as there are little or no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm now closing the receipt of public comments. Do staff have any closing comments? Closing comments from staff. Okay. Uh, do council have any questions for staff? Seeing none. Clerk, did we receive any additional comments since the close of public comments? Uh, no. Okay. Council will now make its decision on the application. Do we have a mover for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Klassen. Um, any debate? Seeing nobody on the queue, we will now move to the voting panel. Great, and that passes with uh, none in opposition. All right, making good time, folks. Item number three, CD1 rezoning 255 to 285 Southwest Marine Drive. Do any members of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on this item, item number three? Seeing none, okay. The clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by Billard Architecture Inc. to rezone 255 to 285 Southwest Marine Drive from Residential Inclusive District to Comprehensive Development District. This is to permit the development of a six-story residential building with 69 strata titled units, a floor space ratio of 2.39 and a height of 22 meters with additional height for mechanical appurtenances are proposed. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendations. One piece of correspondence in opposition has been received since it was referred to public hearing and that is up to 5 p.m. today. Great. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, this, at this point, I'm going to give the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106145-POUND before the close of the speakers list. Phone number has been posted on X and will be available on the live stream. There's also an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added at the end of the registered speakers list. Since there are no registered speakers, I suggest that we waive the presentation. Can I get a mover for that? Moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Carr. Uh, any debate? All those in favor say yay. Opposed say nay. That motion carries. Okay, we, uh, would the applicant team like to present the application if in attendance? Is the applicant here? Yes. That's I'm available online. Colored. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did they wish to present anything or are they fine? No, I, I think that the project is uh, pretty um, self-explanatory, And but if, I'm, if there are any questions, I'm here to provide the answers. Thanks, Robert. Okay, uh, are there any questions from council to staff or the applicant team, noting that this is the only opportunity for council to ask questions of the applicant? Okay, seeing none then, I'm gonna issue the second call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item, wish to speak to council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by the participant code 106-1445-POUND before the close of the speakers list. The phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. 
any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium before the close of the speakers list. Speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. Uh, clerk, do we have any speakers on the line? We're in chambers. Uh, we have no speakers on the line or in the chamber. Okay, well then this is the third and final call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106-1445-POUND. Uh, before the close of the speakers list, the number's been posted on X and have made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chambers, please come forward to the podium. We will now take a five-minute recess for any additional speakers. Starting now. Thank you. 
Hey, uh, Council, we'll just get back, uh, show on the road here and turn on your cameras if you're online. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Uh, clerk, do we have any additional speakers to provide comments on this item? No additional speakers are on the line. All right. So seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. Seeing as there are little or no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm now also closing receipt of public comments. Does the applicant have any closing comments? I'm going to take that as a no. I see Robert on the No, I, no I don't. Thank you. Okay. Do staff have any closing comments? Staff have no closing comments. Do council have any questions for staff? Seeing none, Clerk, did we receive any additional comments since the close of public comments? We did not. Okay, then. Thank you. Council will now make its decision on the application. Do we have a mover for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Carr, seconded by Councillor Montague. Um, is there any debate? Seeing none, we move to a voting queue. And that passes. Oh, so I think Councillor Meisner's now absent, so we'll mark him absent. Thank you. Okay, that passes with none in opposition. All right, item number four, CD1 rezoning 5490 Ash Street. Does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on item number four? Seeing none. Uh, the clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by South Seas Development to rezone 5490 Ash Street from Residential Inclusive District to Comprehensive Development District. This is to permit the development of a four-story residential building with 14 strata titled residential units, a floor space ratio of 2.03 and a height of 13.7 meters with additional height for a rooftop amenity space or mechanical appurtenances are proposed. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendation. One piece of correspondence and support has been received since it was referred to public hearing and that is up to 5 p.m. today. Hey, thank you. Uh, at this point, this will be the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1 833 353 8610, followed by participant code 106145 pound before the close of the speakers list. Phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added to the end of the registered speakers list since. There are registered speakers for this item. I suggest we hear the staff presentation. Oh. Chair, I just want to, sorry for the interruption, but we've actually lost audio on the WebEx. Okay, um, we'll hold the line for just one second there. We're gonna take two minutes. Thanks, Councilor Bly. Councillor Bly, can you hear us now? We can hear you now. Okay. A okay. Uh, where were we? We have uh, staff from Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability here to present the application. I do see Councillor Montague on the queue. Chair, yeah. so just would like to move the recommendation to not hear from the presentation. <laughs> okay. So we've we've had <laughs> uh, moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Carr to waive the presentation. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, seeing none, uh, 
we're going to waive the presentation. Um, would the applicant team like to present the application of an, if in attendance? Nope. Oh, okay. Are there any questions from council to staff or the applicant team noting that this is the only opportunity for council to ask questions to the applicant? Seeing none, this is the second call for speakers then. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 1061445 pound. Before the close of the speakers list, that phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chambers, please come forward to the podium before the close of the speakers list. <clears throat> uh, speakers have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. We're now going to hear from the public, uh, starting with speaker number one, Chantel dobles Gehring. Hey, Chantel. Hi, my name is Chantel, and um, I used to sublease on this property. And right now I live in Burnaby. I'm a UBC graduate. And yeah, I just wanted to speak on behalf of the young people surrounding this space. There's been a community garden in the front yard, and there's three really large trees. Like, if three people are around it hugging the tree, there's like three of those on the property. And I like really want to advocate for those trees not to be cut down because they're huge and like three people hugging the tree and like there's no others on the prop um, along the street and yeah it's been a community space I think maybe 200 people have gone through this space there's been like music jams that have happened through this space and it's been a real place of community for people and I'm not opposing this. Um, I'm just, I just wanted to use this to voice my opinions about um, what it's like to be a young person living now. And yeah, it's really difficult. So like, I, I just really want to advocate for affordable housing and, you know, living here was um, very affordable for us and that, you know, I think in terms of community engagement, I've been reading the Canby Corridor Plan and you know, there's already so many existing communities here and there's so many people leaving the city. Like, I have friends who, you know, were UBC students, and everyone's, like, wanting to leave the city because there's no liveliness here, you know? And, like, everyone's being displaced, and it's a real problem. And I just wanted to voice that. And, um, yeah, and so I think given all these things, I just wanted to name this not just for this property, but for all rezoning that, you know, you take into consideration that, you know, we can't really afford these places and that there's not really places in the city that um, are affordable for young people, even people who are my friends at UBC. And these are people who are like UBC land and food systems, farmers, people who are like care about well-being. I'm an arts worker and I work with kids and I've worked like in the Shadbolt Center. I live in North Burnaby now, but you know, like we're really wanting to make this a sustainable place to live. And right now it's not possible. And so, yeah, I just wanted to move that forward. And yeah, I just really want to speak on behalf of these three really big trees on the property. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting emotional, but um, yeah, it's really important that you hear me on this. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chantel. Oh, actually, Chantel, sorry, you have a question from Councillor Klassen. So Chantal, I want to thank you very much for coming out tonight um, and expressing something that um, we don't hear often enough, which is that young people really need to uh, have options to live and have housing in this city right now. Um, uh, I know that you're uh, in, in the sort of arts field right now. What do you think we could do better to try and support um, people in your field of the, of the arts uh, in Metro Vancouver? Well, I think having like open community spaces. So right now it feels like, you know, the way that you're designing living is that um, people are not talking to each other in these buildings. There's no like sense of community in these places. And I mean, specifically for the arts, I would say having like um, free spaces that people can come to, spaces that people can contribute to. Because I feel like if it's just like an open room that people come into, that's like empty and you just rent it. There's no life there. There's no, you know, books people can read. It's not like a community space that people feel like they're contributing to and are familiar with. So I feel like, 
yeah, having um, spaces that people can like, you know, with murals and different things and like the Canby corridor plan, I'm not sure, you know, what the, how long it's going to be, but I don't even know if the people I know are going to be around for that. Um, you know, the time of construction that it's just like, we're losing so many people because of all of this construction. So I just think, yeah, I, if that answers, maybe. That's great. No, thank you very much. I've heard comments like that, um, about sort of activation, uh, shared space and things of that, that nature for people to come together. And so, uh, your observation is, is really a valuable one. Thanks a lot again for coming out tonight. Thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Chantel. Uh, speaker number two is Kitty Martins. Kitty Martins here. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I, so I'm Kitty Martins. I'm also a former resident of the Moss Portal. Um, it's been a very important community to me. Um, but I mean, I think that what I want to speak to is something that goes much further than, than, than just my involvement in this. Um, it's definitely beneficial to have more third places that we can, that we can spend, especially as artists. Um, but just as community members and people trying to make a home in the city, um, places that you don't have to pay just to be there. But um, the, the bigger issue I wanted to talk about was something that's come up a lot um, in terms of tree retention in the city. Um, so the statement I wrote was a written statement, and it starts with a statement that every plot of land is either a carbon source or a carbon sink. Um, and land that's allowed to grow plants is a carbon sink, a slow carbon sink, but it is a carbon sink. Um, land that's covered in concrete is a carbon source, and when the concrete is poured, that's, that's what makes it a carbon source. Um, but most building materials, including a concrete, all heat up more than forested areas like grasslands, uh, forested areas or grasslands under the sun. Um, so the decision to redevelop 5490 Ash Street is counter to the survival needs of each and every person present at this council, and that includes you, whoever's listening. Um, we need carbon negative land use. And we need more housing. Um, both of these things are clearly essential. We've heard repeatedly throughout this whole evening um, of different applications that that we need we need both a way to deal with the heat dumps and we need a place um, we need safe, affordable places to live. Um, now the council is choosing to make an exception to the Cranby Corridor's plan stated aim of preserving green space and street trees as well as cultural space in order to allow for more housing according to the 5490 Ash Street rezoning application. Um, so as a former resident, I can attest to the cultural and ecological value of the Moss Portal and its associated communi community right now. Um, so there's a lot of cultural space and a lot of green space that's already there that's, that's very valuable. Um, carbon negative architecture is not the norm in Vancouver. So we, we're saying like carbon zero by 2030, but we need carbon negative, like really like yesterday. Um, in order to combat climate change, in order to combat like rising sea levels, which will affect most of Kipwana. Um, and so the first implementation of carbon negative, if, if we are going to have carbon negative architecture, um, the very first implementation in Vancouver will, by its very nature, be exceptional. Um, so on its own, this one location, 5490 Ash Street, used to be my house. It isn't anymore. Um, but it's a like because of because of my advocacy and, and the community of advocacy around it. Um, on its own, this one location is a drop in the bucket, but a change has to start somewhere. Uh, the Moss Portal is a place where this change could start. Um, I would be fully in favor of the development of a four-story strata if the building were constructed in a way that incorporates with the existing mature trees. Those ones Chantal was talking about, that you can fit three people with their arms around it. Um, that needs to be part of the structure with a plan in place that allows the structure to benefit from the future growth of those trees. And that's, that's what I would support in terms of carbon negative architecture and sustainable development, truly sustainable development in the city. It needs to be us working with the trees and not against them. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Uh, okay. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to issue the third and final call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 106144-5-POUND. Before the close of the speakers list, that phone number will be posted on X and made available in the live stream. Any speakers in the Council chamber, please come forward to the podium. And we'll take a five-minute recess for any additional speakers.
you know, trying to, trying to be a nice guy. I think so. I would, I would expect. All right, <clears throat> that has been our five minute recess. See, we have counselors online, so we do have quorum. Let us resume. Uh, clerk, do we have any additional speakers to provide comments on this item? We do not. Okay, so seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. Seeing as there are little or no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm now also closing the receipt of public comments. Uh, does the applicant have any closing comments? Do staff have any closing comments? No closing comments. Okay. Uh, does council have any questions for staff? I see Councillor Carr in the queue. Councillor yeah. Carr. Thank you. Uh, I do have some questions around the tree retention. Um, so I read through Schedule B, um, and I didn't see a specific indication that this is a one-for-one -one tree replacement. Um, I just saw that two trees, of the three trees that are... Um, I guess the bigger trees that were mentioned by our speakers are due to be removed. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, if it's necessary to remove all three trees, and I don't know which one is the one that three people's arms circle, but if is that, if you know, is the biggest one that they're mentioning the one that's going to be retained or not? I know two... Two are being. Uh, it's on the the biggest one is the southeast one. Sorry, we've got somebody with a live mic on the line. Sorry, who's speaking? Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, two are going to be replaced for the parkade. We tried to re redesign it, but unfortunately that's not possible because of the size of the lot. Uh, the third tree on the property, I believe, remains. That's the big one, I believe. Then there's 10 street trees, of which two are official city trees, um, which have to be replaced. But unfortunately, because there's no boulevard and no sidewalk right now on 39th, that need, needs to be done because of accessibility uh, reasons, and that's why these trees now have to go. But we try during development application to work with the applicant so as many can be retained as possible and or replaced. Okay, don't we have a law that says, or a bylaw that says one for one replacement for trees that, um, that are going to be removed, or is that only on the lot, not on the street? If you can do in the mic, sorry. That's correct. That policy applied to private property only. Okay, so it's up to the city to replace and, and to ask a, a developer to replace the, uh, help replace the trees if they're not on the lot but on the city street. Is that right? Um, that we have to work through parks. Um, right, or tree okay. Replacement, yeah. Okay, so I'm understanding that the largest tree is going to be retained um, and that they're, you're going to work with the applicant to replace the trees. Yes in whatever way possible around, okay, um, yeah, that's, I, number one, okay, I'll leave it for that, I'll, 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 I'll speak to comments later, those are my only questions to staff, thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Councillor Carr. Um, Clerk, did we receive any additional comments since the close of public comments? Uh, we did not. Okay. Uh, council will now make its decision on this application. Do we have a mover for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Klassen. Um, is there any debate? Councillor Carr. 
Yeah, I just really appreciate the young people coming and talking about how important um, the environment is to them, that the trees, the tree canopy, the, you know, the beauty of those old growth trees. I've spent a good portion of my life protecting old growth forests in British Columbia. So I'm really appreciative of, of that interest and, and the importance of that in a city, especially as we're densifying. Um, uh, and uh, it's not only for the obvious natural features in the, in the landscape, but for quality of life and for a healthier environment and one that's more resilient in terms of, of climate change. So um, thank you for coming to speak, those online and, and in person. Um, and I really, really hope that staff can work with the applicant to retain, um, to, to, to really choose. I'm so happy about the biggest tree and really hope that that tree survives well and, um, and that there is a replacement of trees that really do provide um, canopy um, as well uh, in a changing climate. So... Um, I will be supporting the uh, application. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Uh, seeing no further comments uh, or debate from Council, I'm going to move us to a voting queue. Chair, can I get a vote assist in favor, please? Councillor Kirby Young. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. And uh, that passes with none in opposition. Okay. Last item. Item number five, CD1 rezoning 1749 to 1769 East 33rd Avenue. Does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on item number five? Seeing none. Um, the clerk will now read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by Intracorp to rezone 1749 to 1769 East 33rd Avenue from residential district to comprehensive development district. This is to permit the development of a five-story residential building and a four-story residential building with a total of 109 secured rental housing units, a floor space ratio of 2.20 and maximum building height of 19.1 meters with additional height for rooftop amenities are appropriate. Proposed. The General Manager of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendation. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing. 31 pieces of correspondence in support, 16 pieces of correspondence in opposition, and 13 pieces of correspondence dealing with other aspects of the application. And that represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thank you, Clerk. So this is the first call for speakers. Any speakers for this item who wish to speak to Council, please call toll-free 1-833-353-8610, followed by participant code 1061445-POUND. Uh, before the close of the speakers list, the phone number has been posted on X and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for new speakers and missed speakers to be added to the end of the registered speakers list. Since there are registered speakers for this item, I suggest we hear the staff presentation. We have staff from Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability here to present the application. Do you? Good evening, Council and members of the public. My name is Sarah Cranston, rezoning planner for this application, which is being considered under the secured rental policy. The subject site, shown in red, is located in the Kensington Cedar Cottage neighborhood and is located on 33rd Avenue, two blocks west of Victoria Drive. The site is comprised of three parcels, which contain three single detached homes. There are two tenancies eligible for protections under the tenant relocation and protection policy. The surrounding area is comprised of low density residential uses with a commercial zoned area along Victoria Drive two blocks east of the site. The site is adjacent to Vancouver Co-Housing, a strata titled co-housing complex zoned CD1564, highlighted in white. The site shown in red is located near parks, schools, childcare, and the Kensington Park and Community Center. There are bikeways close to the site, as well as bus service along 33rd Avenue, and the proximal arterial roads. 
The rezoning enabling policy for this application is the Secured Rental Policy, or SRP, which encourages construction of new purpose-built rental housing in Vancouver. The SRP aligns with the rental housing goals of the Housing Vancouver Strategy and the Complete Neighbourhood Goals of the Vancouver Plan. The policy is accompanied by RR design guidelines, which provide design guidance for redevelopment. As shown on the below right map, the surrounding area has development potential under the secured rental policy. The sites shown in dark blue and red can redevelop for mixed use buildings and apartments up to six stories. The site shown in light blue can rezone for residential apartment buildings up to four stories. The application proposes a rezoning to CD1 for a five-story rental apartment building fronting 33rd Avenue and a four-story rental apartment building along the rear lane for a total of 109 secured rental units. A density of 2.2 FSR and maximum building height of 19 meters are proposed. The proposal includes 37 parking stalls, 170 bicycle stalls, and two loading stalls. This is the correct number of stalls. Staff note that there is a typo in the parking and transportation section of the report, which references an incorrect number of stalls. This typo has no effect on the bylaw or the conditions being considered this evening. As shown in yellow, the site is approximately 220 feet deep and has a downward slope towards the rear lane with about 15 to 17 feet in grade difference between the front and the rear of the site. For these reasons, the site is considered atypical as per the policy. For atypical sites, the SRP allows a rezoning to CD1 rather than to an RR district to accommodate the site irregularities and to allow a more site-specific design. As shown in red, for deep sites, the design guidelines allow a courtyard form of development. The design guidelines permit this site to redevelop as an apartment building in the front and three-story townhouses at the rear. When staff were reviewing the application, it was discovered that the atypical site conditions created challenges for the site to develop in accordance with the guidelines. Rear townhouses are not possible on this site given the atypical depth and slope and the resulting challenges for fire access and sunken ground floor units. As shown in the red box, the RR design guidelines also permit deep sites to redevelop as two apartment buildings when a site is fronting two roads. Although this site is not double fronting, staff are recommending a development scenario with two apartment buildings to ensure proper fire access to the site and livable lower units. This scenario is shown at the bottom of the screen and generally upholds the form of development expectations of the policy. The two apartment scenario does not exceed the permitted density that would be achievable through the applicable RR districts. The Housing Vancouver strategy seeks to deliver a range of tenures of affordability across the housing continuum. Renting, shown in green, has lower monthly costs than home ownership, which is shown in orange. For this application, a virtual open house was held March and April of last year, and 114 pieces of correspondence were received. Comments in support of the application include the addition of secured market rental housing, density, building design, support of the building's amenities, and ongoing neighborhood revitalization. Comments of concern were received regarding the height and density, privacy and overlook, sunlight and shadowing, increased traffic, reduced parking availability, and concern for roadway safety. In response to feedback, staff have the following responses. Regarding height and density, the five-story building at the front of the site meets the expectations of the SRP. The height and form of the rear four-story building is in response to atypical site conditions. Regarding privacy, there are no balconies proposed along the shared property lines. This proposal meets the side yard setback requirements and exceeds the rear yard setback requirements of the design guidelines. The applicant has also offered measures to enhance privacy along the west shared property line. 
Regarding shadowing, the site follows the design guidelines for setbacks, building depth, side yard setback, and upper story stepping to minimize shadow impacts on adjacent properties. The greatest shadow impact from the proposed development is on the development site itself. Regarding traffic and safety, rezoning conditions include a new flashing crosswalk at 33rd and Commercial Street to improve pedestrian safety in the neighborhood. The crosswalk will look similar to what is shown on the screen. Engineering conditions also include a land dedication from the subject property for widened boulevards and sidewalks along 33rd Avenue. Staff have also conditioned the use of convex mirrors at the parkade exit to improve safety within the lane. Regarding parking, the proposal is required to meet the parking bylaw at the time of development permit. The site has the option to reduce parking requirements with submission of a TDM plan. The public benefits accruing from this application include a DCL contribution of approximately $2.3 million. No CAC is due as the CAC policy exempts low density secured market rental rezonings. The additional benefits include the 109 secured market rental units, which would be secured through a housing agreement. In summary, staff recommend approval of this application as it is consistent with the SRP and advances the, sitting, the city's housing policy goals. If approved, the application will deliver 109 secured market rental units. Staff support the application subject to the conditions in Appendix B, and staff and the applicant are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would the applicant team like to present the application? Just raise the podium slightly for me. Thank you. Now that I know the features available, I'll request it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Mayor and Council, and I appreciate the opportunity um, just to say a few words about our proposal. Um, as noted by staff, the proposal is for a rental housing building under the secured rental policy. The site is transit adjacent in a short stroll to neighborhood serving amenities such as retail, and it makes it a suitable candidate for increased density. Over a decade ago, a three-story co-housing building was approved by City Council. The site is adjacent to a single-story post-war bungalow. The rezoning was vigilantly opposed by nearby residents as being out of scale. Today, these two buildings coexist harmoniously. I certainly hope that a five-story building can coexist with a three-story building within a broader single-family context that is rapidly evolving. The project, if approved, would deliver 109 rental homes in a neighborhood with a near zero vacancy rate. In the context of SRP, the form of development meets the intent of policy, and our proposal thoughtfully considers its adjacent uses. To complement the city's engagement process, we met on three separate occasions with the co-housing building to listen to concerns, including a site tour with our project team. And in response, we'll be incorporating a planted buffer with soft landscaping and a permeable fence. This is a good example of two neighbors working together to come up with a solution. The proposed building itself has been designed to foster community by, engaging so by encouraging social gathering and connectivity with generous indoor and outdoor spaces for residents, with areas for dining, urban agriculture, work from home and study pods, fitness, entertaining, and even a dog run. As the city grows, we need to ensure that there are a variety of housing options and affordabilities to meet the needs of, our pe of the people who live and work here. And, a building, and building more secure rental housing in all areas of the city is a crucial component to this. I urge Council to, to support this application. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, are there any questions from Council to staff or the applicant team, noting that this is the only opportunity for Council to ask questions of the applicant? Okay, seeing none, this is the second call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 1061445 pound. Uh, before the close of the speakers list, this phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium before the close of the speakers list. Speakers will have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. We're now going to hear from the public, starting with speaker number one, Robin Tavender.
Good evening, Robert. Robin, you hello. Know the yeah, yeah. All right. So um, I don't really like this scale of development, and it's not. I mean, I talked before. Do I have a? I don't see a number here. Should I see a number? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't like this scale of development, and I've talked to council about aesthetic reasons and sort of urban landscape architecture and things like that before. I don't think it's particularly humane, but as you increase density in an area, then that creates additional burden on healthcare services and other services. It creates burden on outer resources like um, regional parks and things like that. And I could go on and list things like CT wait times and MRI wait times more specifically. And there isn't really a mechanism, as far as I understand, by which all of this is taken into account. So I don't agree that the densification of Canada or British Columbia or the city is being done in a judicious way that reflects some sort of um, planning process that maintains or increases quality of life measured in terms of both access to green space and regional parks and also access to unfortunate things like MRIs and CT scanners. We clearly have larger wait times for many things now than there were historically, including medical specialists. But So that's a problem I see with the, the built form and how it doesn't respect the inhabitants of the area who will have longer wait times for ambulances because I'm pretty sure BC Ambulance isn't putting in more ambulance halls that effectively, and recruiting paramedics is a challenge. And it's not just this one development, it's as the province goes forward with its densification strategy, there will be serious resource contention. There already is serious resource contention. So I, I really must say that I feel this form of urban development is irresponsible for a number of reasons related to density and the inability of the province and other areas of government to keep up in terms of the provision of services. I think we're building ourselves into a trap here that isn't going to be anything like what it was to grow up here 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But I also wanted to comment, speaking of growing up here, on in the draft bylaw, you have conditions of use and five, the design and layout of at least 35% of the total dwelling units must A, be suitable for family housing, and B, include two or more bedrooms. Now, I struggle to understand how two or more bedrooms is family housing. If you're having replacement levels of children, you're going to have one for the two parents. I'll try and be politically, Chris, say the two parents. But then if you're having children and reproducing naturally, you have about a 50-50 chance of having your second child have the opposite gender. And as I understand, contemporary social work guidelines are that after five, you can't have children with the same gender sharing bedrooms. So how is it family housing when you have a bedroom for the two parents and then you have a bedroom for one child, then do you have, not to be grisly, but a sex-selective abortion to fit within your um, uh, built environment? That doesn't seem to me very reasonable. And then also 65% of the housing, if I've done the math correctly, I'm not, not very good at math, that um, doesn't even have to have two bedrooms. So um, I, I wonder at how this is suitable family housing when there isn't even a requirement for any three-bedroom units, which would seem to me to be pretty reasonable for family housing if your goal is to encourage people to have replacement numbers of children. I know many people my age and younger who have been blessed with children, and when they talk about why they don't have more children, the economic situation is a big one. They can afford a bedroom for one child, but they can't necessarily afford a bedroom for two or three or four or whatever number of children they would have if nature took its course and not 
constrained by the economic factors. So I guess that's what I want to say. I don't think this is a good development trajectory for a number of reasons. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Robin, and right on time. Okay. So um, before we move to the next speaker, Council, uh, the clerk's pointed out that it is now uh, 20 minutes to 10, and we have at least six more speakers to go at five minutes a pop. Uh, so if we want to extend this meeting past 10 o'clock for the purposes of debate and decision and completing this last item on our agenda, we'll need a unanimous vote of Council. Moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Dominato. All in favor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Seeing none opposed, we are going to extend past 10 to complete the business. Okay. Thank you, Council. Uh, speaker number two is Cam Dore, the Vancouver co-housing member. Good evening, members of Council. I preface my uh, remarks by looking at Appendix B, which was included in the documents. It seems like some of the Numbers in Appendix B have changed, and so I'm wondering a bit about that. But uh, one of the items in Appendix B was uh, item 1.1, where there was a reference to uh, the, build the two buildings and actually expanding the space between the two buildings so that there would be more recreation space, especially for children. That in turn pushed the building back towards the alley the, the northern building back towards the alley and would eliminate the parking in the alley. But in that same uh, area, uh, it talked about 19 parking spots, uh, 15 of which were inside, and, and now I hear there's 37 parking spots again. It was initially 37. So I'm wondering what's happening there. Um, we're, we were pleased to see the parking spots at the back of the alley eliminated by pushing the building back, if that's in fact happening, or, or that was a suggestion, um, because that eliminates uh, the, the danger to the children uh, who are using that alley. Uh, unlike, uh, we have um, 31 units and we have over 100 bikes. So we're obviously a biking community and there's a lot of people who bike down that alley. And so uh, seeing those spaces eliminated in the back was, was uh, particularly gratifying. I'm not sure what will happen at this stage. The uh, proposal, though, talks about space for 40 bikes and when there are 109 units. So uh, it's quite different than ours. We have three bikes, essentially, to every uh, unit, and they seem to have one bike to every three units. So it's... It's hard to imagine that the 40 would be enough, but that's what seems to be in the proposal. There's also in that same area, 1.2, a recommendation that the building at the back also have an amenity space on the roof. And at this point, I'm still not clear if that's actually happening or not, but uh, that amenity space would suddenly look, overlook all of our spaces all of our common space. In the past, if the amenity space was in the, in the um, front building, it wouldn't really overlook as much of our common space, but in the back, it definitely does. I would be hoping for a fence or something, uh, some screen of some type so that um, we continue to have the privacy that we've had as, as a co-housing community. It also talks about uh, the ideal would be 35% of the units would be available for families. And uh, that's great. We, we think it's great to have um, more rental in the area and 35% would be terrific. Um, but it has implications on parking because if you're in fact having more families there, then um, you're gonna need more parking for these same families. It's much more difficult for a family to haul um, a stroller and car seats and bags for children down the street looking for parking or trying to use parking. And so um, naturally we'd be concerned about that the kind of parking issues um, that would be presented by this many uh, families. And we think it's a great idea to have more families. The more two and three bedroom units, the better. Um, 
Finally, I'll just talk about one area, uh, and it refers to the front, and it looks at section 1.25, where they talk about moving the bike stands off the kind of public space back onto the private space. I think that's a great idea because it, it in fact, uh, uh, cleans up the sidewalk so that there's not any bikes hanging around the sidewalk when people are walking by. Um, I, and that, that will be helpful to us. It also talks about public benches in that same area. Um, I'd like to see a public bench, but on the, on the property that is the city's property, so that, in fact, people are likely to sit on it. Uh, we have two benches on our property, but they're, they're on our property. And as seniors go by, having gone to Victoria to do their shopping um, and come back with bags of groceries, um, they're hesitant to stop and use our benches because they're on our property. And I think it would be great to have a public bench in that area, and I would certainly encourage the group to apply for it. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and seeing no questions for you, uh, thank you for uh, coming to speak to us. And the next speaker is speaker number three, uh, Vicento Molina. Yeah, hi, I'm Vicenta Molina, and I was here eight years ago with Vancouver Co-Housing, which has turned out wonderfully, by the way. So we're right next door. And I would like to thank you on behalf of your work for Vancouver and for the people that would be living in this um, proposed development next door to us. We want to make things livable for Vancouverites and the neighborhood and for the people that will be living there. And I'm specifically concerned about the parking issues because um, the, the, uh, I don't think there's been enough consideration about the area and the par need for parking in that. This section of, of East 33rd is near the top of one of the hilly parts of Vancouver. And it's not easy to cycle up to that hill in the more... Uh, cold, winter, rainy, snowy. I mean, people do it, but I'm 82. And <laughs> yeah, like you, everybody can't do that. And um, the East 33rd transit is a very infrequent bus at this point. And it's a two lane road, uh, quite busy. So, um, and also it's a single lane each way. And the neighborhood is already packed with cars lining all the streets. And so um, parking spots can be really hard to find. Like someone really would need to carry their groceries and their toddler in the car seat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this is to be market housing, not subsidized housing. And many of the residents will have jobs else elsewhere. And they think they're going to be the kind of people that would have cars. So here at this point, and, and I am a bit confused about the number of parking spots, there were going to be 37 spots for 109 re units. And some of these would, a lot would be working people that have to go somewhere. They'd have kids. Um, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, reasonably, they should have more underground parking, like a whole other layer of it, even though that's more expensive. So it doesn't really make sense for this 109-unit development to have only 37 parking spots. And then one of the messages we got about the development, it was down to 19 parking spots. And I think this is really an important issue. Um, so there shouldn't be any reduction of parking. It should actually be increased. Um, also, the bicycle parking was confusing. Uh, one um, summary that we got was um, a certain number of bicycle spots, not enough for one bicycle for every unit. And then in your presentation, was it 170 bike stalls? And is it 37 parking spots? It's, it's not 19, as was written once. Um, so we, we do want Vancouver to be a bicycle-friendly city and transit-friendly, but considering this hilly area, 
and the number of residents, I think the parking could be reconsidered. Thank you, that's all. And thanks for your work. Thank you, and thank you for thanking us, and thank you for coming to join us. Uh, speaker number four is Molly Cavanaugh. Is Molly Cavanaugh on the phone? Hello. Hi, Molly. Hi, Molly. Oh, hi. I'm here in council. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak in support of the application for more rental housing at 1765 East 33rd. My name's Molly, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. As a local renter in the community, I'm really pleased to see this project come forward for your consideration. I think it's really important to bring more purpose-built and secured rental projects forward, given there is such a high percentage of renters in our city. Many people know, my, or many people that I know, myself included, have experienced the stress that can come with renting through a private landlord and the instability that comes with it. I have a baby and I sincerely hope that we don't have to move again anytime soon. Building rental housing that is secured is or that is secured is such an important move in both terms of delivering the kind of housing supply our city needs most, but also in terms of providing renters with the confidence and housing security needed to invest their time and skills in Vancouver and plant solid roots here. I do acknowledge that more and more rental projects are coming forward and are being built, but I want to support this project specifically today because this part of Vancouver doesn't have a lot of secured rental buildings yet. So I'm pleased to see it coming forward for your approval. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Okay, uh, speaker number five is Rick Morrow. Hi, Rick. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Siri wants to talk too. Um, thank you, Council and uh, uh, Mayor, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Rick Morrow. Uh, my wife and I live a block away from the proposed project site. Um, the application package put together uh, by RWA on behalf of their clients, Intracorp, is very impressive and obviously the result of substantial effort. Um, while my wife and I fully support the city's efforts to address the housing crisis through increased density and promotion of rental housing and other initiatives, uh, we have to object to the application as submitted. Uh, for us, the project is just too big for the site and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, I should say I'm a graduate architect. I've worked uh, for the past 30 years in architecture and construction. For about 15 years, I worked in traditional architectural practice before moving into project management, and I currently work as a project director for a well-known uh, local construction company. So I understand the development and construction business and the challenges. Um, in reviewing the comments online, a few things seem very evident to me. Uh, the people supporting the proposal are almost all saying the same thing. Uh, rental housing is desperately needed, and for that reason, they are supporting the proposal. Um, the problem is that this is not just a vote about whether or not you support rental housing. This is about a specific project. I fully support the approval and construction of more rental housing as well, but this particular project is just too big for this site. I would support this project on another site, or I would support a smaller project on this site. Um, actually, I might still have difficulty supporting this project as designed because of the lack of parking mentioned by some of the other speakers and the potential burden on local infrastructure, unless the city committed to corresponding improvements on those elements as well. Um, in reviewing the comments from those opposed to the project, there's also a common theme. Almost everyone opposed to the project is in favor of densification and more rental housing, but feels that the project is too big and has not considered the impact on the neighborhood. 37 parking spaces for 109 units is just not sufficient. Uh, there's already a shortage of parking in the neighborhood. Traffic is already a problem. Adding 109 families on one site will cause severe congestion on the local streets. Uh, the project proposes an increase from the existing three single family homes to 109 rental units. We would have no objection to some sort of moderate increase in density, maybe something similar to the co-housing project of 30 units. Um, we're aware of the city's recent efforts, of course, to increase density in selected areas and on certain streets. Amby Street and King Edward are notable examples. Those streets have the scale and capacity to absorb uh, developments of this size. In terms of scale, they have boulevards and multiple lanes for additional traffic. The buildings don't look out of proportion and they don't feel like they dwarf the surrounding context. This location on East 33rd is not that kind of site. There are 
are more suitable locations. Uh, while it technically may be an arterial street, this part of East 33rd has the size and scale of a local residential street. It's single lane, two-way traffic with parking on both sides. During busy times of the day, it's not uncommon for traffic to be bumper to bumper for almost the entire stretch from Knight Street to Victoria Drive. And on days when there are activities at the church, the surrounding streets are filled with parishioners' vehicles. Often we can't park near our own house. Um, the description of the project uh, concept, how the massing is broken up and how the materials create layers, etc., are all moot because the building is, to me, twice as big as it should be. The important design concept missing from this section of the application is scale. Uh, the applicant previously noted that the co-housing project was vehemently opposed due to the scale, and now they're proposing a building that's three times the density of the co-housing project and double the height. It's a decent looking building. The units are nice. It's just too big. Uh, we purchased our home almost 25 years ago, and over the time, we've watched the neighborhood evolve. We've seen older, small, single family homes replaced by new, larger ones with suites and laneway homes or even multi-unit developments like the co-housing project uh, or the pending Alpen Club redevelopment. We welcome these changes. We hope they will bring new amenities and options to our neighborhood and improve the enjoyment of our home. This proposed development would not bring positive change. Trying to improve the housing situation in our neighborhood shouldn't be to the detriment of those currently living here. This will drown our neighborhood. Philosophically, idealistically, Politically, the project might make sense, but logically and realistically, and with common sense, it doesn't. It's just too big. It doesn't fit the site. Put 30 units in. Include enough parking for all the units. Make it three stories so it doesn't tower over the entire area. That would make sense, and that I could support. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> okay. Uh, speaker number six by phone is Fancy Tam. We have Fancy Tam on the line. Good evening, um, Mayor and Council. My name is Fancy Tam, and I'm speaking tonight as a representative of the Victoria Drive Business Improvement Area Board of Directors. Our organization are advocates of the business on Victoria Drive, and our boundary spans from 32nd Avenue to 55th Avenue. We represent 523 business members from the retail, hospitality, and service sectors. As an organization, we are in full support of Intracorp's rental housing proposal at 1749 to 1769 East 33rd Avenue. Part of what ensures we have a thriving local economy is having a healthy and sturdy local housing market that will not only meet an expanded customer base for our members, but also provides housing options for those working within our boundary as well. So in our opinion, rental housing is really important aspect of this, and so we are thrilled to see more purpose-built rental coming into our neighborhood. So thank you for the opportunity to comment on this proposal this evening. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Fancy. Uh, next, also on the phone, uh, speaker number seven, Olive Dempsey. We have Olive Dempsey on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Olive. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Hi. I've heard about the length of these public hearings, but I've never sat through them. Um, so appreciation to all of you who do that so regularly. Um, I um, So I will be as brief as I can, and I'll try and add um, an additional perspective to what we've already heard. So I, um, I live right next door to the proposed development. Um, in fact, almost all of the windows of my unit um, face will face uh, one side of the development. And I want to speak specifically about the, the transportation demand management and the parking issues, because I... Um, I think it's really important, and I think it's a, it's a really critical issue to consider from the lived experience of people in the neighborhood. So I'm someone who, um, I'm an avid cyclist, um, I I use transit a lot, I have two, two children, and um, there are lots of days where I, you know, don't use a vehicle, and there's absolutely no way that I could live in this neighborhood without having access to a car. It's just unrealistic. If I were to take transit to City Hall right now, it would take me over half an hour and two buses, and that's just not um, realistic for how I live my life. And so I think expecting um, people uh, in this proposed development 
to not use vehicles is unrealistic. And then I think consequently what we'll see is that there'll be um, extreme stress in the neighborhood around parking. I would very much love for people to not need vehicles in this city. Um, that is my goal. And um, and I think right now, given the um, level of transit accessibility in the neighborhood, um, that it's just unrealistic to have so few parking spots for so many units. And I want to offer that from the perspective of a person who I think is the kind of person that would be renting in this in this um, in this development. I want to point to two other things briefly. Um, one is also issues around safety. So I noted in the um, criteria, the conditions in the approval around um, safety on 33rd. I think safety on 32nd needs to be considered as well. Coming out of the lane on the 32nd, we already have near misses with cars going quite fast on 32nd. And I think again, with uh, increased parking issues, we'll have even less visibility. And there are many, many, many children who cross that road twice a day to get to school. There will be even more, I'm assuming, um, with this development. And so I think there needs to be traffic calming and other requirements put in to help ensure safety um, on 32nd and also on commercial, again, where that lane exit. I think it's um, really critical. And then finally, I want to speak something that was um, not been shared yet at all, which is to questions around the increase and in, um, the urban heat island effect. And we know that increased um, density also um, increases the urban heat island effect and it's something that is noted in the um, in the report from staff as something that should be considered by the developer but I'd like to see stronger language around that during the one of the recent heat waves our own um, so I, I live in co-housing as well our own courtyard um, was too hot to to, to walk in essentially. And so we know that we're only going to see, see increased extreme weather. And so I think that this development, again, for the livability of the folks in it, as well as those in the neighborhood, needs to consider um, in more detail um, how they're going to address that, um, that concern. So I'll stop there. I'll just say that you know, I offer all of this from an intention to make this a livable place for the people who um, who are living in the in the units and for the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and um, because I think it's important that we respond to the housing crisis in a way that um, actually works for all um, all who who live in the neighborhood. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Olive. Okay. All right. Uh, that is our speakers list. So this is the third and final call for speakers. If there are any speakers for this item who wish to speak to council, please call toll free 1-833-353-8610 followed by participant code 1061445 pound. Uh, before the close of the speakers list, the phone number will be posted on X and made available on the live stream. Any speakers in the council chambers, please come forward to the podium. We're now going to take a five minute recess for any additional speakers.
All right, council, that is our five minutes. So if you're online, please turn on your camera. Great, okay, we have quorum. Thank you, Councillor Bly. All right, and apparently we do have speakers on the line. Uh, clerk, uh, first speaker is Andrea Avison, resident of Vancouver, is that correct? Andrea? Hi, uh, yes, hello. Hi. Yes, Ron, hi. Yeah. Um, so yes, my name is Andrea Avison. I am a resident of Vancouver and I support this development. So as we all know, Vancouver is experiencing a rental and housing affordability crisis, which is one of the reasons that so many people are moving away. Um, I'd like to see rental housing applications expedited to help alleviate this pressure. This project is in a great location, close to Commercial Drive, therefore it's close to transit so you can get everything you need without a car. I also think that people with cars might be deterred from moving to a place with no parking in the first place, so the parking thing may be less of an issue than some might think. Um, so I expect demand for these new homes will be strong. I hope that you will vote in favor of this application and thanks for the opportunity to weigh in. Okay, was that it, Andrea? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Uh, next speaker is Sandra. Uh, Ramazani. Sandra Ramazani on the line? Uh, hi, yes. Hi, Sandra. Sandra Ramazani, thank you. I, I will speak very briefly. I know it's been a long night. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, I have honestly just mixed feelings. I am 100% in favor of building more rental housing. It's extremely uh, important in, in Vancouver in particular, as well as anywhere in BC. Um, however, the I do agree with most of the speakers is that the parking is not sufficient at all, because as a, a person moving, uh, I'm a, an immediate neighbor of this site, I've experienced transit. It's really not, um, it, it's, it's not sufficient to get around the city. It's like, it, it, but if I try to commute to work, it's very it, it's very time consuming. It takes three times as long as driving. It's just it's just simply not practical at this time. And I think the, like many developments, the the development itself may be fine, but the the greater inf looking at greater infrastructure needs in the community need to be addressed. Like our our school in the immediate area, Selkirk, is already um, there's already people on wait lists to get in and it's even with a, it's one of the largest schools in elementary schools in Vancouver and even it is over capacity. Um, so if, if this had been, if this development were combined with looking at infrastructure needs in the community and improving transit, I would be much more in favor of it. Um, in general, I don't want to see more cars and more parking. I'd like to see more biking and, and transit, but even the, the bike lanes in the area, they're quite unsafe. Like I don't, I have a, a child and I will, I'm not comfortable heart with her biking without an adult, even though I actually moved from an area that was closer to bike lanes and I, I was actually quite a bit more comfortable with her, with her biking. So I, I just, I, I, overall, I support the, the I, I support the building of more rental Housing 100%, I just feel like there's a few miss very important missing pieces that need to be addressed before this goes forward. So that's all I, I wanted to add. So thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Okay. That is uh, Sandra. Okay. Uh, Clerk, do we have any more speakers on the line? There are no additional speakers on the line. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, seeing as there are no additional speakers, the speakers list is now closed. And seeing as there are little or no comments received after 5 p.m., I'm also now closing the receipt of public comments. Um, does the applicant have any closing comments? No, none from the applicant. Do staff have any closing comments? None from staff. Do council have any questions for staff? Mr. Boyle. Um, thanks. I, I just wonder if staff could say a bit more about the transportation demand uh, efforts here um, and, you know, recognizing the the hills and, and not excellent transit right now, what we uh, anticipate seeing um, being provided or changing in the future to, to make sure that families moving here can get around.
Uh, thanks for your Good question, afternoon. Councillor. Um, well, TransLink is the primary regional operator of transit services, so the city doesn't have authority to implement additional capacity or new routes, but we work with TransLink to support new infrastructure and advocate um, for increasing services where it's appropriate. Did you want me to speak to um, the TDM as well? Yeah, that would be great, thanks. Okay, um, the applicant has the option to reduce parking requirements at the development permit stage with submission of a TDM plan. Um, and the intent of the TDM plan is to reduce the development demands for vehicle trips and parking. Um, and I'll note that the reductions through a TDM would not apply to visitor accessible or loading spaces. So it would just be for the residential parking requirements. Okay, um, and can you uh, say a little too about the capacity for, um, I know we're seeing a lot more families on electric cargo bikes and, and using a larger bicycles. I assume that's part of the plan. Um, if like, do you mean the, the number of bicycle stalls that are being provided on the yeah. development site? Exactly. It's 170 stalls. Okay, and space for larger bikes is just what I'm getting at. Um, I presume so. Um, perhaps Alan, my colleague in transportation, might have some additional comments for this. Yeah, thanks, Councillor, for the question. Um, so at this time, this uh, application, we do not have detailed breakdown of the types of bike spaces that will be provided in terms of the different sizes and vertical bikes and stacked bikes, um, but those details will be provided at the DP stage. I can also provide details of the list of the TDM measures that the applicant has proposed, but. Um, that, that's good. I, and I, I appreciate it's 1015 and um, that a number of these details get figured out at the next stage. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Good news. Councillor Boyle asked one of my questions related to traffic management and considerations, and particularly in light of the questions and concerns raised about uh, parking uh, and the parking allocation. I know the area quite well. Um, I did want to just follow up on a, a question around, um, in addition to that, um, staff referenced in the presentation around the intention to put in a, a pedestrian controlled crossing. Um, and I just, could you remind me, I just, I can't recall from the map where, where that crossing would be at 33rd and which, like, which intersection? What's the cross street? The crosswalk is yeah. planned for 33rd and Commercial Street which is uh, just east of the site. And is that in this case, in this construct, is um, that funded uh, through um, any development levies through this project or is that being funded by the city? It's subject to a latecomer agreement. So the applicant would be paying upfront for um, the infrastructure and then later developers would be paying that back as the area develops. Okay. And then finally, um, I guess last question, uh, just going back uh, to the considerations around traffic and, and uh, concerns around just uh, managing and livability. Um, in some neighborhoods, we've gotten to a place where, you know, um, we've looked at permit parking. Is that something that would come down the road if there was concerns from neighbors around neighborhood parking and um, pressures on that? Is that something that could be canvassed down the road if there was concerns around that. Yes, that's correct. Um, the the neighbors could advocate for permit parking in the area if they so wish. Okay, um, uh, I'll leave my questions there. It's really late, and I'm probably annoying my colleagues at this stage, so <laughs> I'll I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Uh, clerk, did we receive any additional comments since the close of public comments? Uh, we did not. All right, if that is the case, then council will now make its. So, so uh, unfortunately, that part of the, the public hearing is done, and because it's a quasi judicial process, we're, we're kind of done with the, the public speakers. Unfortunately, we've closed that, that opportunity. There is work to, to, to come on some of the, the development permit side, and Perhaps staff might be able to talk to you a bit about that afterwards, but okay. So council is now gonna make its decision on this application. Uh, do we have a mover for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Montague, 
Seconded by Councillor Dominato. Well, you didn't wink or nod or anything. Okay. Moved by Councillor Montague, seconded by Councillor Dominato. Is there any debate? Seeing nobody on the queue, I'm going to move us to a voting queue. Chair, this is Councillor Claassen. Can I have a vote in support, please? Okay. Vote assist. And uh, that passes with none in opposition. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> that is it. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? We are done. Motion to adjourn. Nope. Councillor Montague, seconded nope. by Councillor nope. Dominato. All opposed? Carried. All in favor? Yes. This meeting's adjourned. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. You too. Holy moly. A long haul.